I, I, well, we welcome. We don't, we don't see you, which is fine for now. But you will have a chance to uh, ask questions, and then at that point, we would be very happy to invite you to to show your, your, your yourselves. Uh, but for now, I think it's best we keep it uh, like this because uh, of the, uh, the the speed uh, flow of, of information. Hey, Maya is also here. Hello, Maya. I'm going to be admitting people. So if you if you want to start introducing Andre. Yes. Hello. But I, you, you already you, you started recording. I have, yes, I have yes, prepared, yes, yes. Prepared a really brief, brief introduction because I'm eager for us to start the, the conversation as soon as possible. So, so please bear with me. I, I suppose it won't take more than five minutes. So uh, welcome everybody to the design space uh, online conversation. My name is Andre Radman, and I will be your host together with my colleagues and, and friends, Dulmini, Bob, and Stavros. I'm an architect and a theorist with a keen interest in what I call Gibsonism, after the champion of the ecological school of perception that belongs to a broader tradition of radical empiricism. So just a brief word on the topic of this online conversation that we hope uh, will grow, as we said earlier, to a fully blown book project. It was triggered by the confluence of two previous projects, namely Footprint 28, a Simondonian issue edited by Dulmini and Stavros. The title is All is Information, Architecture, Cybernetics, Ecology. And I underscore this, the, the, the special writing uh, of information is information. And this issue is uh, about to be published uh, any any day now, uh, perhaps in the yeah, next next two weeks or so, yeah. Um, yeah. if everything goes according to the plan. And I said the conference, and the second one is the uh, uh, issue on on Stigler, edited by Bob and myself. Uh, the title is "Epiphylogenetic Turn in," and this is a kind of clever play on words in tertiary memory of uh, Bernard Stigler, uh, forthcoming in uh, spring. 2022. So as we know, one plus one does not equal two, but 11, or in this particular case, 16, because there are 16 panelists that are meant to be. We are still waiting for two to, to join. At any rate, uh, what we have realized, our group, is that we cannot not be transdisciplinary anymore, given that the challenges that we face today do not fall neatly within any disciplinary boundaries. To borrow a subtitle for a an influential book, at least to me, it is not about the world of design, it is about the design of the world. More specifically, from the architectural point of view, the design of space always comes late, and it is good that it comes late. What we ought to crack is the space of design, the pre-individual or the phase space. Building a phase space, according to Sanford Quinter, requires remembering not the past that has happened, but the past that has not happened but or, although it might have, and I'm, I'm quoting from uh, his uh, uh, essay, Radical Anamnesis uh, from the Far From Equilibrium book, 2008. Uh, crucially, there is no resemblance between the actual design of space and the virtual incorporeal yet real space of design. Such non-entailment calls for a, what Eric Horl would call generalized ecology, which to my mind uh, immediately uh, refers to the problem of, of quasi Causality. So now a word on the subtitle, technicity, or technicities in, in plural. It comes from Simon Don and it designates a mode of relation between organisms and their environment. This is the Batesonian irreducible for unit of, of, of survival. A mutual reciprocity between habits and habitats, a force of psychosocial invention and cultural transformation that propels an evolution by means other than life in Stiglerian terms what Delanda calls a non-organic life or the, incomplete, the idea of the incomplete nature in, in Terence uh, Deacon. So uh, uh, let me, so that concludes like the, the, the content uh, part of the introduction. Let me just give you a few household rules. So we have already announced uh, that we were, uh, we would not, have, we would not allow, I mean, we were hoping not to have a, a screen sharing so that we, we may have a, um, 
come as close to emulating a round table uh, setup. We have already asked for the permission of all the participants for, uh, uh, for the permission to record this. Uh, so in case anybody is ob has any objections, please tell us now. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we would love uh, to encourage the panelists to, to keep their cameras on for, uh, and, and, and the audience to be patient with us and to keep their cameras off for now. Uh, and uh, so after this brief introduction, we will have four slots of 30 minutes uh, per, per, per each uh, technicity. And we will have a, a 10 minute break halfway through. Uh, and, uh, and then we will finish with the Q&A session. So without further ado, I invite the participants yet again to literally introduce themselves just by in a single sentence. And I, and I, and I welcome also Shin Wei and, uh, and, and Heidi who have uh, joined us in, in the meantime. So now we are complete. We've got the four, fifth, 16 panelists. Uh, so if we, if we could uh, have a, a, a one sentence per, per person and, and then I will pass it on to Stavros who will kick us off with the first of four technicities that of information. So. Uh, I, or I guess I already introduced myself, so we, we can just, uh, I don't know if you go, I, I realize that every screen is different, the layout, so how do we? Oh, where you find it? Hold on. I don't know where you find it. We can, I, you, you, do you want me to give, uh, to, to point to each one? Uh, please do, please do. Okay. Yes, I can see, yes. Mm. Okay, then as a pedic speaking, it should be Agnieszka that goes first. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Agnieszka. I, um, I work at the Art Academy in Holland, in Anskada. Um, I run their uh, bio lab um, research program that teaches how uh, to work with living bodies in art and design practice. And then, thank you Agnieszka, then it should be Bruce. Hi, Bruce Clark. Literature and Science, Texas Tech University. I work on neo cybernetics and Gaia theory. That was one of the nicest, concise introductions I've ever heard. <laughs> and then it's uh, Ezekiel. And, yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman, uh, associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Social Policy and Practice. And I do work on uh, technologies and practices of quantification. Thank you, Zekiel. And, uh, and now we move to Gokhan. Uh, hi, Gokhan Kodalak, uh, architect theorist, teaching architectural philosophy at the Pratt Institute. And I am this semester the theories of uh, architecture fellow at UDEF. Thank you, Gokhan. And now, once again, Greg, I think it's the second or third time you introduce yourself today. So, yeah. This, this is the only time I'll talk. I'm Greg Sickworth. <laughs> I'm at uh, Millersville University in the Department of Communication in the uh, concentration known as Digital Communication and Cultural Studies. I do affect studies, cultural studies, a lot of work on Deleuze and Gattari, everyday life philosophy, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Greg. Heidi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Heidi. I am Associate Professor of Architectural Theory. I'm a colleague of uh, Andre Stavros, uh, Robert, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, well, for, for a while, I've been the academic coordinator of the architectural theory uh, group, and I'm part of the Ecologies of Architecture research uh, group in the, in the TU Delft. Thank you, Heidi. And now it's uh, Lila. If I, if I, if I, yeah, your name, I, I put it Lila, actually, yeah, in, in Zoom, right? Yes, okay. Yeah. Lila, yeah. So what you see Lila is Lila what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Lila. Uh, my background is in architecture, and I work as a, a cultural worker and a teacher of social practices at uh, Willem de Koning, the local like art and design school. And my work the past two years has been more on um, kind of cultural activism. Thank you, Lila. And Lucia. Hello, yeah. I'm Lucia Jalón. I'm an architect, uh, currently a postdoc researcher at EPFL at Lausanne, Switzerland. 
uh, and working on uh, questions of uh, landscape infrastructure, but also my research that follows on my, my PhD thesis. It's on minor architecture and what happens when the major, major language of, of architecture becomes informational rather than, than discursive. Thank you, Lucia. And then it's, it's Mark in his, uh, in his nice office in Amsterdam. Yes, first time. Hello, my Fair name is Mark Baumeister. Well. It's a term, yeah. Uh, Mark Baumeister, uh, former colleague of Stavros, uh, Heidi, uh, Andre, of course. Um, now in the same academy as Agnieszka, Aki, uh, University of the Arts in Enschede. Thank you, Mark. And we have Matthew from the she used to be in the great outdoors. Yeah, he's still in the great outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> still in the great outdoors. I'm Matthew Arthur, I'm a former UI UX designer who's now um, a PhD student at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, uh, working in the fields of feminist science and technology studies and also critical indigenous studies. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, Sjord. I am a professor of philosophy in Rotterdam, um, worked together with uh, Andre Fabros and Heidi on a, uh, a, minor, a new minor program on art and philosophy, uh, uh, architecture and philosophy that we set up this year. And um, I do uh, work on the interface of classical metaphysics and uh, art history, among other things. Thank you, Sjur. And uh, last but not least is uh, Sim. Yeah, do I? Sim. Yeah, 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 but I don't know if I S seen entered the meeting, but I, I don't see his camera on now. But I think he's he's either listening to us or getting ready. I think we can come back to it. Okay, later. okay, okay. Perhaps he's getting ready. Andrew, you're done with introductions then. We can go yes, straight yes. to the point. Okay, okay. Okay, because I'm going to repeat some of the things, some of the things you might have mentioned uh, very briefly. And uh, I would just like to say that uh, Design Space, even as a title, uh, came, came our way when Andre shared with me, I think it was end of January, beginning of February, a short excerpt from, uh, from a lecture that uh, President Garestani was, uh, was giving. And uh, I mean, say what you may about Reza, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big debate uh, about him. And uh, yeah, let's not focus on that. But anyway, I'm just pointing to the inspiration of the title. And Reza was defining design space in his own words as something that could be and should be understood topologically. In that sense, uh, I immediately understand uh, topology, me, myself, clearly connected with what Bergson was uh, calling duration. And I'm not going to overload with terms, but what do I mean is topology deals with how things change in themselves, let's say compared to themselves. So how things evolve, how things individuate. And it does not deal with comparing things in the terms of outlines and shapes. So it's not about extensive comparisons. It's about the um, intensities and the durations of these intensities in their individuation. So in that sense, having that in mind, um, uh, what we immediately connected uh, Andre, I, Robert, and, uh, and Dulmini um, when speaking and thinking of design space was uh, something that perhaps, uh, I mean, Gokan that uh, is also versed in Simon Don or anyone else versed in Simon Don is perhaps uh, that we something we could call as autonormativity. And by autonormativity, what we mean by that is uh, that things uh, progress and individuate uh, not based on any given, uh, given teleological rule that they're following, neither or any a priori guideline that they're following, but rather they build upon themselves. It, uh, it's, it's a nice phrase that both Simon Don and Ruyer have used, which goes by make and by making, make yourself. So things build upon themselves. And in this building upon themselves, there is always room for change. There is always room for transformation. And the interesting thing is that uh, this room for change and transformation is also connected with something that we can very broadly call memory. And when we're speaking of memory, though, we can also understand it in a sense that it's close to the interest of ours the last year, unfortunately, due to Stigler's death. But uh, regardless of that, it's, it's, it's good to, 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 to remind ourselves but when we speak about memory, uh, it's, uh, it's particularly interesting, uh, especially for architecture, to understand memory in its tertiary dimension. So memory as technologically produced, if we could say it so simply. So memory, not about remembrance or about archiving only, but memory in the sense of an experience that has been accumulated and it's technologically produced and technologically expanding. Next to that, Stigler would add that uh, besides memory, there's also technologically produced desire. And that's also something we could address. 
So as you can understand, if memory and our desires are technologically produced, and by technologically we mean artificially, let's call it like that, architecture also is part of this. Architecture is also assisting in this fervor individuation of this broad and open contingent design space. So these four domains, the four technicities, they all try to tackle this issue of how we technologically, artificially produce our making. These four domains try to tackle it from different perspectives. And the first one we're gonna start, it's gonna be the one that focuses on so-called informational technicities. And uh, since I've been charged to, to kind of introduce the first uh, informational technicities, I would like to clarify that when we speak about information today, we're gonna understand it as something that has nothing to do with data. Information is much closer to something that the uh, Ook School, for example, would have in mind as biosemiotics. Or in very simple terms, information is understood today as meaning in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our discussion. And by meaning, again, not meaning in the sense of languages, signification and the rest, but meaning as significance. So meaning as what would motivate someone, dead, alive, uh, artificial, natural, uh, anything, anyone, what would motivate someone for action. So in that sense, it's also very close to what, for example, Gregor Matthew would have in mind as affect. To affect and be affected. What would motivate you to affect? And what would motivate you to allow yourself to be affected? So in that sense, information is understood quite closely with what um, uh, Gregory Bateson had in mind when he was defining it as a difference that can make a difference. Uh, and in, uh, a potential that could energize further a potential. It's a, as a side note, we were having a heated discussion last week with Andre whether information is produced or actually not produced. And if it's not produced, how we could speak about information? If information, in other words, is not something that pops out of nowhere just because you decided to do so, we were actually thinking that perhaps a good way to approach information would be as something that is transduced in Simondonian terms. When we say transduced, you can really, um, really uh, simply understand it as information being continuously produced, not by one alone on its own volition, but by precisely material relations themselves, by relationality itself. So in that sense, and I'm closing off, and I promise it's going to be the most you're going to hear of me today. In that sense, and getting into the topic of, uh, of how informational technicities could open the discussion, I have three questions in a row which uh, I would like to invite uh, Greg, Matthew, Gokan, and Seward to think of them, not necessarily to respond if they don't have something to say right away, but they could be the ones kind of getting started with the discussion and anybody else of the invited people also could chip in as well. That's, that's the point of, uh, of, uh, of having all of you today here. So my three very brief introductory questions when it comes to information and informational technicities would be first that uh, could we indeed understand the capacity to affect and be affected, affects, as essentially informational, or in other words, as dependent on material relations. And secondly, if we do that, if we connect affects, information, and material relations, what would be the importance of the manner or the style that we actually get ourselves or allow ourselves to be involved in material, material relationality itself? And finally, if we speak about manner, if we speak about style, then how could we approach architecture itself, both in the information that it is produced of, so the material relations that produced it, and also in the information that it produces back, in the material relations that it introduces. I think I might have overloaded everyone, but uh, I don't mind waiting for anyone to chip in now. In you any can repeat that first question one more time? The first question would be, okay, I'm gonna simplify all three of these points. Could we understand affects as essentially informational, or in other words, as dependent on material relations? If we do so, if we speak about material relations, what would be the importance of style or of manner in dealing with these material relations? And essentially, in the end, how could architecture be, or our understanding of architecture, or in other broader terms, our understanding of intervening to an environment, how it could change itself if we place it within material relationality, within information itself. We can leave the last one for the end, perhaps, since it's going, going more you precise know, so into architecture. So by, by architecture, you mean niche constructionism, anything to do any, with uh, any, manipulating any, surfaces. Any environmental manipulation. manipulation, any attempt to change your environment for better or worse. 
Greg, since I know that you are <laughs> that you are more than into affect theory, what would you have to say regarding affects and material relations? Sure, I'll jump in. And because you linked affect and information to Jakob von Uxko, I think certainly if we understand information in the way in which Uxko understands uh, the animal or its relationship to its uh, environment, its ecology, uh, then we get close to uh, kind of, as you mentioned, significance as something that's larger than simply a kind of meaning. Uh, and and I, when I think about affect, um, I always think about it in three kind of modes. This is kind of Spinoza's from Deleuze, but I always think about affect at, at once at one mode as a kind of uh, an intensity of encounters, right? The kind of contact, uh, the kind of what happens when two bodies affect and affect each other and Spinoza called it affectio. Uh, and, then, um, and then a second mode, which is affect is a kind of betweenness or relationality. Well, affectus is this kind of, as Deleuze said, a continuous line of variation. I always think of the first, by the way, as a point, a point of contact. Affect is this mode of intensity or encounter that is, is um, often the kind of transference of energies between bodies as, of significance. We think about the tick in the, in the yeah. case of Hook School and, and the way in which uh, the tick has these um, affective uh, relations. And so the first is the kind of affect as a point of contact, as significance of information, as the arrival of, of uh, some kind of intensities. And then second, effect, effectus, which is the notion of this kind of uh, betweenness or relationality, what you carry with you can be a kind of memory, uh, a, a maybe non-conscious. We we're talking about Proust earlier, Proustian kind of uh, a memory that's as much located in a body's relationship to its environment or its ecology as it is to any kind of specific point in a brain or a hand or whatever. And then the third, I always think about it as kind of the plane of eminence, which I think of as kind of the capaciousness of the capacity to affect and to be affected. And so for me, we have a point, right, which is affect as a kind of moment of contact of this encounter of bodies. Mm -hmm. Second, affect is constituting relations um, that are a kind of betweenness uh, mm -hmm. of a body mm -hmm. and it's in this wider set of, uh, you know, assemblage. Um, and then uh, third, the idea that that potentially anything and everything has the capacity um, to engage with um, bodies in this kind of eminence. So it's a point, a line, and a plane. And in affect, I think, in affect studies, all three of those, for me, uh, holding those together are important because I think sometimes a lot of people work in one of those or predominantly in one of those. So I think you can't just be stick to one of those. You're always, you're, you're thinking and you're in your way in which you want to uh, approach whatever it is you're you're encountering or, or writing about has got to eventually probably cross all of those. But we can think about someone like Sarah Ahmed being located in this kind of space of the encounter, the point of contact. We can think of someone like Lauren Berland who writes about infrastructures and kind of institutional relationalities as being something closer to the betweenness. And then someone like Patricia Clough or Brian Masumi or uh, uh, people like that who are very close to that kind of plane of eminence of affect. And again, I think for me, those are what I, you know, how I understand in a really quick way. When I, when I read someone's essay or I'm trying to think through some problem, those are the three modes I try to engage with. Um, and then I'll let Matthew talk about how this might play into design when I put him on the spot. Um, but he, he certainly can speak to some of the ways in which um, we can enact those in our design practices. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. You also did, you also did me a favor by, by passing the ball to Matthew. So yeah, Matthew. <laughs> I don't mind taking up the baton. Um, I'm, I might skirt around design for a moment and just say uh, about the question of affect being informational, that if I'm, you know, maybe thinking with someone like Masumi about, you know, power to affect being primed by what comes before, I think that I would say that affect is citational rather than informational. And then that brings us into the realm of problematizing practice and problematizing the material context of doing knowledge work. Um, and so where I want to want to go with that sense of citationality is, um, well, first to invoke an, an article, short article written by Andrew Murphy called Fielding Affect. And he makes a really profound point that if we look to Indian aesthetics, if we look to magic, if we look to the climate, if we look to the you know, vibrancy of the, of the non-human world, these are all modes of, of affecting and being affected. And so affect does have a citational problem in terms of uh, the kinds of invocations it makes when it's building its canon to think with. Um, and to connect that to the question of style, you know, I'm thinking about something that Gloria Anzaldúa 
wrote, which is that style brings up matters of allegiance. It brings up politics of inclusion and exclusion. So I think the, the question of the informational, if we're tackling it citationally in terms of generationality, in terms of what's maintained in practice, which is, a, you know, sort of a, a linchpin of um, STS thinking is to attend really to specificities in practice. If we're thinking in that way, then I think style and then it's practical application in what we might call design. But of course, design is really just a set of questions about making subjectivity and agency. If we connect all that together, I think that then we have to start thinking strongly with this, what we're calling the minor technicities strain and think about questions of inclusion and exclusion and what worlds and futures we're ushering forth. So it's a very practical design answer, but. No, 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 it's, it's, again, it's helping me a lot because it's opening up the question to Stuart, which I mean, Stuart, even by mentioning his book, uh, his book earlier, the matter and manner, right, Stuart? Right, okay. So yeah. I would like to put you in discussion now with Matthew. I mean, as to how he approached style right now, if you are, if you are, yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna say what sure. you might be in favor or not, but how would you take this point of Matt? I think style, uh, I like the, the, the reference to citationality, but um, I don't know, I'm not sure how we define style. I would say that style is uh, as a mode as, is to be understood in terms of uh, something that you can participate in, not necessarily something you can be you belong to. And so style in that sense is non meriological And in that sense, yeah, maybe non-exclusive, which doesn't, of course, uh, uh, um, prevent it from becoming a major and from us to, uh, needing to differentiate between major and minor um, styles, which traditionally, of course, is done in terms of style and manner. Um, I think manner, in a way, is the is is a form of information. But now I'm wondering a little bit about conceptual relations between information on the one end and mode and modes on the other. But uh, manner defines how a matter, how a body matters. Um, and the body can matter in many ways at once. So you can, you're always on a plane in that sense. Um, you're participating in many different um, modalities, which converge and diverge, as, uh, as Simon Don describes. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I, um, um, style is exclusive, but style is also, by definition, uh, incomplete. To use another notion that was already already mentioned, so it's related to maybe to information. Uh, to the I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase your book, and I know I, I don't think we've discussed that before. But when you say matter and manner, I read matter as the first law of thermodynamics, which means that matter is finite in the universe, in the cosmos. And manner are edited as the second law, which means that, in other words, that that regardless of matter being finite, material relations are not, and that's why we can even do things around us. I mean, we can relate matter in different ways. Would you agree with that? That manner could be the the, the capacity of ours, given given by by default, to relate matter differently. For sure, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um... Yeah, but that's uh, again that has to do with the relation between information and style, I guess. That manner, but there are entropic styles and there are negentropic styles. Um, so uh, some styles uh, in increase our capacity to combine and recombine matter, and others don't. Or increase uh, our capacity to affect. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah, I'm talking about combining, recombining, but uh, maybe yeah. I, I always speak in a Leibnizian register rather than a Spinozist register. So <laughs> that's what you'll see. But what I think, uh, what manner does in a way is, uh, or what mannerism is, is the is an art of multiplication. So uh, given a certain material that is in one or several modes, um, these modalities can always be multiplied, copied, uh, recombined. Um, so, yeah, I think um, it is through multiplication, which is a particular kind of repetition or replication, um, that you introduce 
uh, or did you did you try to discover the interstitiality of uh, a certain material? Um, yeah, maybe multiplication is a form of modulation. This is uh, what Simonon would say. I'm just bringing concepts together here, uh, I guess, in response when to you, it. When you say that you take it from a Leibnizian perspective, you also make me another favor. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking to all three of you because you make it easier for me to bring Gokan into the discussion because I know Gokan comes from a, uh, from a Spinozian instead of Leibnizian only perspective. And I would be curious to hear Gokan and what he thinks on, uh, on Stuart's point. Just to just to spice it up, uh, because you're staging this uh, Leibniz versus uh, Spinoza, I, I was reminded the other day a, a very cryptic brief note uh, by Stephen Hamiro, who who says that uh, I think that uh, uh, if we for those who are interested in science fiction, I think science fiction uh, Leibniz would have more to do with science fiction than, than Spinoza. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> All right. I mean, what interests me in this section and in, in the Star Wars question is the aesthetics of the information field on the question of affective significance. Right? Now, Cezanne, as we all know, the turn of the 20th century painter, he had a peculiar obsession. He painted uh, Mont Saint Victoire, the looming uh, mountain of his hometown, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in southern France, again and again and again in more than 60, 60 paintings. I mean, drawings, oil paintings, watercolors, uh, you name it. And he did this for more than 30, uh, yeah, 30 years until the day he died. And one day, uh, his friend asked him, I mean, why? Why this mountain? And why again and again for 30 years? What is going on? And Cezanne said, look at Saint uh, Victoire there. What a land. Right? These masses were made of fire, and fire is in them still. Now, this, is, this might sound something poetic, but I think there is a metaphysical, even a philosophical, systematic logic beneath it. And, we can talk about very shortly about three three layers of information. The first is the quantitative, right? The size of the mountain, the space it fills, its extension, etc. And Cezanne, as you can see, was not interested in that quantitative info. The second we can say is the qualitative, right? The qualitative thing for the perception of colors, the impression of uh, tectonic forms, etc. And Cezanne was not that much interested in the qualitative thing, right? although he is deemed this post-impressionist in architectural, in art history genre. Etc. The third is the intuitive, right? The underlying distribution of the mountain's potential. Right. The singular magnitudes of the mountain's vitality, it's Elan Vital, right, as Bergson would say, or if you will, the ontogenetic design space, to use the term that we use today, of the mountain. Now, this, this intuitive information was all that Cezanne was interested in, because Cezanne was capable of intuiting what caused the mountain to be, Right, meaning is on the Genesis, and he said these masses were made of fire. And if you think about it, they were indeed made of magmatic lava and fire from a physical perspective, but also from a metaphysical perspective, you can think of it as some kind of thinking about the very potential of the mountain. But he could also intuit the magmatic undercurrents flowing right now beneath the mountain's unbending posture. Not only you know referring back to its birth, but also its renewing, uh, ongoing individuation, and even its open-endedness for future individuation. And if you think about it, it's incredibly poetic because that lava, that core, that fire, connects everything on on this earth, right? The, in in a sense, all the mountains are connected, uh, all the geological force and, and everything in this earth is connected by that fire. So fire is in them still. So I would like to conclude uh, with uh, Star Wars's third uh, question with another question and uh, even a provocation, provocation, if you will, and I'm say that you already, I'm telling you already that I'm going to redirect your question to Lucia because I know yeah. she's also into Spinoza, affect bodies, etc. So you you question it, and I'm going to take it to Lucia. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, not even a question, but perhaps uh, an observation. And I would say our current architecture milieu is very, very skilled at quantifying. Okayish at qualifying 
and very, very poor at intuiting information. That's what I would say. But that's why I insist and I agree, I agree also with Matthew in his approach. I think the citational approach to information could be, could be actually very well complementing uh, and, and broadening up the understanding of information, which I think nonetheless is needed in order to precisely do what Dogan is saying, to, 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 to stop confusing information with data. Uh, I mean, Lucia, when, when, I don't know, I mean, you know your research much better than I, but uh, I think that uh, nothing but had to do, for example, with uh, any kind of body touching another body, again, human, human, anything, could be ever quantified. And even if it is quantified, it wouldn't convey anything of that meaning, that means <laughs> to come into an encounter, as Greg was saying. You know, I think that... Um... And please, please answer in a tri triad. You, you saw the pattern already. Three things you have to say. <laughs> It's going to be more difficult, <laughs> but no, I, I, I was thinking that um, like I um, I do see that that, that uh, informational as something that it's not data, but I do think that we need to think that informational in a world that thinks of the informational as data, so that it's shaping uh, how things operate, so that 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 extension of quantification that it's uh, in a way uh, restricting, uh, pushing against uh, that intuitive layer that, that Gohan was, was mentioning, uh, that intuition that feels that it's more, it's unmeasurable, it's, un, uh, it's impossible to grasp, it's impossible to represent, it's impossible to put into QGIS or into AutoCAD, um, but it, it's being restricted. So I think that it's interesting to also consider that conflict, no? how uh, information as data is, is colliding with uh, that informational uh, as effect, uh, as effect no? or in, in its affective uh, dimension, because uh, what, uh, with the notion of the that's, for instance, like what one of the things that I'm uh, looking into right now, it's the, the, the idea of the nuts, no? how we start to modify behaviors by nudging. So uh, how there is an algorithmic touch yeah. appearing through uh, all directions and shaping the, 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 our spaces of, of possibility and short circuiting in a way that affective continuum that allows for the informational to, to, to flow. No? So um, I, I think uh, a lot about the idea of, of ballistics. No? We are kind of in a, an aesthetic ballistics receiving all these um, signals in, in that sense of, of the, the beautiful text of, uh, of Deleuze and, and Parne uh, when they are talking about, about Espinosa and New York School and, and, this, and the, the signal in the middle of the night. Um, but those signals are getting so fast and they are getting uh, to us in a way that are starting to short circuit this kind of, of continuum of, of the affective, no? So that's why I think it's, it's uh, for me, it's important to, to think those two layers of the informational together and how they are colliding because one, it's, it's affecting the other and it's making it uh, transform, no? So. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm happy that you put it like that because it gives me the opportunity to, to, to continue with Dulmini's, uh, Dulmini's interest, which is the symbiotic one. And before we do that, because I think it kind of smoothly goes towards that direction. Uh, before we do that, I would like to, to, to I mean, it's, it's almost anecdotal, it's a joke. Uh, I was reading the other day a book that uh, Bob and Andrew recommended to me by Kevin Kelly, which is called What Technology Wants. And uh, it's, it's, a not, I mean, it's, it's an interesting book to read. It's not, it's not difficult at all to follow. It's an extremely simple book. Uh, it might be flawed in some of its, uh, in some of its approaches. Uh, they might sound a bit too deterministic. But uh, he has a very nice line in there, which is saying that, um, if you want to produce a human-like entity, then do a baby. So in other words, if you want to produce a machine or a computer or anything that thinks or behaves or acts like a human, then just do a baby. There's no need to do a machine. And for me, the, the interest in that question is the other way around, is why do we nonetheless want to produce human-like entities if we could just do babies? And I think that perhaps that could be, I mean, we haven't practiced that. But perhaps that would be a nice, interesting starting point for Dulmini in speaking about not only information, but how information informs not just us, but the world around us. 
Stavros, Stavros, just because I, I'm paying attention to the chat, uh, Shin Wei has uh, uh, kindly uh, also introduced the topic of what escapes computation. So before, because Dolmin is one of us, she's the host. So I, I was thinking maybe we should give a, a word to yeah, 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 I haven't seen that. Exactly, it. yes. Uh, and Shin Wei should also probably introduce himself, which he also missed. So we will start with you, Shin Wei. <laughs> oh uh, first of all, I give my apologies because I'm not, um, I'm dealing with some urgent family business, which is why I've been muted most of the time and restrict my comments maybe in chat to be um, respectful of the conversation, which is very profound. Um, my, uh, my name is Shashin Wei. I'm the director of the Synthesis Center at Arizona State University. Uh, and also before that, the topological media uh, lab in now Montreal. And for some years, uh, we've been exploring uh, on, the, on the side of art, uh, the making of responsive environments, environments that respond to collective intention and collective play, okay? Using all sorts of emerging technologies, whether they're wearables or involving fields of light or fields of sound, okay? Uh, in the last 10 years or so, we've been also expanding uh, the uh, connections back to theater, to live arts, but also to design and architecture, uh, and also to infrastructure. So, which brings me to connections to this group via thanks to Grace to introductions with uh, Domini uh, through looking at complex systems. That's my mm -hmm. introduction. Yeah, thank you very much, Inve. And um, I guess then we can just uh, move into the kind of the second um, uh, thematic. And so I'm Domini, and um, I'm not a TU adult. <laughs> Uh, but um, I'm very much interested in, as um, uh, Stavros and Andre started to talk about this, I mean, and I really kind of relate also at, um, at, at, at the end what Lucia said about the having to kind of teach about this informational in a very different way in a heavily data-driven society and this tension uh, in discussions. And, um, and I guess that is where this uh, symbiotic technicities come in. Um, and as you could see in the discussion or the, the description, we have mentioned uh, Francisco Varela and uh, Humberto Maturana, and this is, this is this comes from a very particular discussion about information complexity, and it is also uh, coming from a theory of biology. So I guess that that was a kind of in the history of discussing complexity, that was one point in which people started to turn to bios. So I guess Andre already mentioned the face space. Uh, the space of emergence. And so this was actually a place where Humberto Maturana and Varela was in the scientific context trying to address this, not by using physics, by biology. And then, of course, um, they had links. So they were a cognitive biologists, but they had links with um, second order cybernetics. And they were like really supported by Heinz von Forrester, who was also working on open systems and dynamic uh, systems that were not necessarily uh, um, concerned with equilibrium, but although not in the same register, they were kind of um, supporting each other in their discussions. And here we have terms like self-reference in systems, autopoietic systems emerging in, in cultural discourse uh, for the first time. And thanks to people like William Irvin Thompson, who I guess uh, around the 1980s through the first two Gaia conferences, um, and also Stuart Brand through Coevolution Quarterly started to kind of take this discourse and um, kind of disseminate it around. And then people like Varela, Maturana, also Juan Forest started to kind of contribute to this discussion. And so there is the kind of very different um, way of addressing face space uh, through emergence. And this idea that uh, we are not talking about preconceived conditions, but that reality is in itself always being constructed in a certain way. And this was also a very interesting kind of a, um, a way of addressing the neo-Darwinist turn. And so they were like taking us uh, to kind of look beyond this neo-Darwinist trajectory. And I think this is also something that both probably um, Shin Wei and uh, Bruno can contribute to. Uh, and then also talking about certain terms like open systems versus closed systems. So this kind of dynam uh, binaries were really reformulated within this discourse. And most recently, uh, you see people like, this is where it becomes very different. So we start from autopoiesis and then uh, later on through people like Lynn Margulis, this has become um, a discourse where we start to talk about symposis. So Margulis basically used this to kind of then talk about um, 
a symbiosis and to kind of go beyond autopoiesis. And this again is a very common topic of discussion and that has also helped to address difference, I guess, in a radically different way. Um, so to kind of get into this discussion, I think I would like to start by um, introduce, I mean, uh, Bruno Xinwei, and we also had Matthew, I guess, in this trio. But I guess um, from what Ezekiel was saying, with his interest in recursive systems, he might also be like really an ideal person to kind of contribute to this. Um, I would like to kind of um, ask your opinions on how you um, address this kind of phase space of the BEOS, and it could be through a certain term like open system or recursiveness but however you wish to do that. Shall we put someone on the spot or not? Yeah, uh, no, I'll, I'll okay, jump Bruce. in. Yeah, Bruno, okay. Uh, hi, I, my full name's Bruce Clark. Bruno's the nickname. Uh, here's the book, people. Uh, Guy and Systems uh, uh, touches on just about everything that Dal Almini mentioned in her in her introduction. So uh, I should say that I I I I'm not a Deleuzian. <laughs> so so uh, rather I sort of where I hang my hat is on what I call neo cybernetic systems theory, which I trace from the second order cybernetic turn. Uh, uh, codified by Heinz von Furster at the Biological Computer Laboratory, where he worked very intensively. Uh, Maturana was a very good friend of Heinz's and a close colleague who came to the BCL uh, while Varela was actually finishing up his doctorate at Harvard, and and uh, and then later. Uh, uh, but but was collaborating with Maturana in the constitution of the concept of autopoiesis. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, through collegial contacts, uh, both Lovelock and Margulis, the inventors of, and developers of the Gaia hypothesis, uh, encountered Matron and Varela uh, at these uh, symposia uh, sponsored by William Irwin Thompson uh, in the 80s. And so, and, and uh, Margulis really incorporated the autopoiesis concept uh, as a result of these contacts. Lovelock, not so much. He was still pretty, he, uh, in terms of the, this particular cybernetic idiom, Lovelock remained basically a first order control theory cyberneticist and saw Gaia as a planetary control system, whereas uh, Margulis uh, dug in uh, to the autopoiesis concept, which grounded, which still in the in the fundamental presentation of Matron and Varela as the definition of a living system. So here, instead of planes and 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 intensities and flows and all this good stuff um, in in the discourse that we've been listening to, uh, one talks about operation closure and the constitution of systemic boundaries uh, internally produced. So this is these are ideas basic to the concept of autopoiesis. And so then the question or the problem becomes how do systems uh, how do systems connect uh, if they're internally produced and internally self-maintained? But but on the other hand, you look around at life and you see, well, life got itself hooked up to itself from the get-go. Uh, in other words, uh, cells are autopoietic, but that doesn't mean that they aren't at the same time affective insofar as they find the, uh, the they find, <laughs> they get together with themselves and they elaborate themselves into higher order structures. Okay, let me back up just a bit because in this milieu, uh, there was an intensive discussion of information uh, that I, I think connects, uh, that, that's completely different from Simondon's development of the term, okay? But, but what they were working with was classical information theory coming out of uh, Shannon, uh, Shannon's information theory. And so, which then kind of 
co-evolves with cybernetic ideas with the first cybernetics. It, they're so closely related that it's kind of hard to tease them apart. But they really are separate ideas. And gradually, I think with Maturana's help, von Furster, real, uh, who is intensely like in his classic essay on self-organizing systems from 1961, uh, it's really all about the application of information theory to living systems. And of course, this is an ongoing effort, but I think what Heinz saw early on was the mismatch between, and, and which we're still living with today uh, in, in terms of the algorithmic and the data-driven and just the, in, the inhuman aspect of, of machine operation relative to the living systems that that are, you know, that bring these machines forth as part of their uh, evolution. So gradually, so Heinz von Furster then uh, uh, issues some very, I think, trenchant critiques of the information concept insofar as one tries to I consider information as something sort of ontologically substantial like matter, <laughs> as opposed to information being being basically, it's a form of relation, but it's a ratio that it, it's a virtual entity uh, as opposed to, uh, well, okay. So those are some very deep debates. Well, no, no, there, no, but... no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something that we discussed and agreed not to do. But I'm, I'm a bit tempted. So I would like to, to, to spice it up, as Sandra was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not only for for Bruce, but also for anyone else that might want to intervene. So without going into detail in Maturana and Varela and their vocabulary, if you think of terms like structural coupling, or if you think of terms like the ones they took from Oyama, basically natural drift. Wouldn't you say that these that work together also are quite close to the Simondonian understanding of information as actually meaning that propagates individuation? I'm just not deeply enough in the Simondon to give you any kind of definitive answer. I, I'm willing to believe that that is so. Uh, uh, but, but I can't, maybe I could toss it to Shinwei, who's much more adept uh mm -hmm. on these particular topics mm -hmm. yes um Shinwei, then probably you could have a go at it and then of course speak a little bit more about ontogenesis okay um okay um i don't want to get too much into it but i wonder if uh, there, there's a book by muriel combs which is very profound i think translated by thomas lamar tom lamar into english where uh, the way the way that at least in there, that uh, individuation described, it doesn't seem to me that individuation, prop it seems to me it might be mis difficult to imagine what it would mean to say that individuation propagates. Uh, it might be a property of, or uh, a phenomenon in experience, but so maybe we don't need to think of it as propagating. Um, sort of like, you know, when water is super cooled and you drop a little something into it and freeze a solid, right? So it's like your super cooling, super criticality is more like how we think about Simondonian individuation. But let me uh, use that as an opportunity to say that there's, I think it is very rich to think in terms of Simondonian terms, to think for, for information because it's always has a sense um, simultaneously of, um, of articulation uh, and um, of forming, right? As well as informing, right? Of articulating, shaping, yes, of course, but it's always matter already doing this itself. And also uh, a way of bringing to awareness, right? In when we say this kind of thing, we're thinking in terms of, uh, in, to use radical empiricist notions, we're not thinking of a subject object a priori to that, that event of informing, right? So that's just my comment, okay? Just specific to that. Um, that's why uh, uh, I decided to change from using morphogenesis, right, with the hyaluronic hyaluronic sensibilities to ontogenesis. But that's I'll just pause right there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then there was one more kind of term which really comes up in this discourse of autopoiesis, which is the kind of recursiveness. And I think here I have um, I think Ezekiel would be great. I would. I've um, listened to your own kind of position on it, and it'll be nice to kind of see you probably also then addressing what Bruno has to say about it. 
Um, I appreciate it. Um, so I actually want to start by saying that, you know, I, I don't necessarily do work in the, in the world of design, if you will, um, but uh, one might say that social policy is a form of design in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and so with that, I, I almost want to sort of make a, a few comments that are in relation to recursivity. And, and, and as well as with in relation to information, how we think about the interaction of information with, with, um, with recursivity. And in fact, one of the things that, I'm, that I am very, um, uh, very interested in is in fact the, the very notion and, and even dichotomy of closed versus open systems of recursion and what that might mean in relation to the question of indeterminacies, right? And so on the one hand, if we think about how closed systems of recursion are functioning to take on and, and unfold and compress and determinacies, what in fact are they doing? It's merely, it, they're in fact merely seeking to, to maintain the changing same, right? To maintain the same logic of the system, not in a kind of deterministic way, but in a, in a, in a way that, that seeks to, um, I, I might even say, maintain a certain type of um, uh, uh, logic of, of, of a hegemony in, in the logic it, itself, right? Um, but also protecting against maintaining the potentiality, the threat of, um, uh, uh, of course, the word's not going to come to mind right now, but um, uh, destruction, I'll, I'll say for a lack of better words. And, 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 um, and in fact, um, part of what I even want to make this connection, maybe destruction is the right word, because in fact, one might think about the ways in which recursion, if opened up, might open up the very condition and potentiality for apocalypse, for the type of apocalyptic conditions necessary for another form of worlding, if you will. Um, and so with that, again, I wanna come back to the very notion of indeterminacies and put this in conversation with even action, in fact, not ontogeny, but what Fanon called sociogeny and what Sylvia Winter then takes up as the sociogenic principle. So Fanon was thinking about, in relation to the fact of blackness, Fanon was thinking about, on the one hand, the focus, especially by many um, uh, uh, psychosocial theorists in the mid 20th century, the focus on, on ontogeny. And for Fanon, that was not enough. It did not account for the very force and the very work of the sociopolitical, particularly the sociopolitical by way of raciality and the fact of blackness. And, the, and we might even say what, what Cicero, um, uh, 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 what Cicero called the colonial encounter. Um, and, and the ways in which, yes, how the sociogenic, how the sociopolitical becomes that which constitutes the flesh and becomes part of the very becoming of, 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 um, of the body, if you will, a very material becoming in that sense. So the so sociogeny is in some ways, we might say doing the epistemological work of the skin and the ways in which that becomes the remainder in the flesh of the ontogenic. Um, and Winter makes a turn toward, toward neurobiology that um, some might uh, some have begun to really put into question. Um, but I think there are other ways of thinking about the very material flesh in this sense, but also even the flesh in the sense of how Hortense Spillers talks about um, uh, the flesh as well. Um, and so with that, if we then think about these in the, the, the very infinite information, the very notion of indeterminacies um, and the ways in which systems seek to compress indeterminacies within their logic, what then happens when that system is open? What are the ways in which those forms of indeterminacies become forces for in fact transforming the very logic of the system, even opening up toward what, uh, what Luciana Parisi and I have called cosmo computation, a kind of a, a way of engaging in, a kind of um, opening up uh, a, a, a multiplicative and even I almost want to say even a hybridity of a shift of the shifting logics of of, a, of of the system in and of itself. So it's such that no logic maintains any kind of hegemony, but also is as as um, UQ we would talk we'll talk about um, the very notion of cosmotechnics within computational systems. Um, last thing I want to raise is in relation to this, and I kind of want to draw a connection to the previous conversation. Um, um, in relation to style, um, I want to raise, and, 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 and the sociogenic, I want to raise the question to what extent style can or cannot be, uh, or can or cannot fall into the, the problematic of major, minor, or to put this another way, to what extent can the sociogenic or even blackness 
become part of the very overdetermining of style um, so as not to leave style off the hook. Okay. Um, and if you get, uh, Xin Wei, if you can give us the title of that book by, I think it was Miriam Combs that you mentioned, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I post it in the chat. I'll do it in the chat now. I, I know the book, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ezekiel. And I think uh, just to kind of also draw Matthew in, although I think he can contribute again to the minor technicities. Um, and I know you've been working a little bit also with Haraway. So there is a, um, a connection uh, between, let's say, Haraway and Margulis, and also this kind of symbiotic idea. And one thing that happens in symbiosis is actually what Margulis does is to kind of also take this kind of unit of preservation away from the symbiont, which is like the organism and the environment to kind of um, symbiotic kind of um, consortiums, right? And that kind of then gives us a very radically different idea of difference and something that really people like um, Haraway have started to use very effectively um, in their kind of feminist um, ways of teaching and the tools that they create. So I'm wondering how Matthew would um, address that and how you see yourself relating to this notion of difference. Yeah, and I think that... out of this, yeah. I think Haraway, you know, often reels in Margulis in her sort of critical, you know, work of figuration and fabulation, building figures like companion species or, you know, the infamous cyborg. Um, but I was also thinking, you know, buried away in Tree of Knowledge is this two page discussion of languaging, which is looking at language as a recursive processual phenomena. And, and much in the way that Masumi talks about affect being primed. Um, and, and that's been largely taken up by post-colonial theorists like Walter Mignolo, thinking about how as soon as the processual quality of something is, is, is taken up and, you know, parsed through political grammar, that it starts to become convention. So I want to link this back again to conversations of, of style or manners of doing, um, which is to say, you know, when we're talking about the processual, we also have to stay with the trouble of a world that is always already configured by datification, that's already already configured by the, eth, you know, ethological and the ethnographic, right? These are these are matters of style and, and convention and, and, and academic material practices that, you know, continue to ongoingly shape the ways in which knowledge circulates, what sticks and so on. And I think this does again link up too to the question of, uh, style and the minor and major, you know, what Ezekiel just just uh, brought into view for us. I think sure it is inevitable that you have to say something about that. Yeah, I was afraid you're going to say that, but um, yeah, uh, well, I, I really like the uh, Ezekiel's reference to, to uh, the notion of a cosmotechnics within computational systems. Um, uh, speaks to the imagination, and uh, I was one. I would be keen to hear a bit more on it. Um, but um, yeah, I think if, if, I don't know. Um, I'm not. It depends how you how you speak about blackness. I suppose it, blackness is. Uh, you, I think you asked about social genesis and how blackness could. Um, intervene in that or affect that. Uh, what I'm interested in, what I uh, previously when I spoke about, about multiplication and cosmotechnics, I think is about multiplication. It means that uh, there's no, it's not a, you don't operate dialectically in the sense of, uh, you, there's nothing to negate. You begin affirmatively, but you always produce a new version of what is already there. That's uh, basically the task of style, to produce yet another version, to add something new um, with some kind of retroactive power, of course. So, um, you know, uh, there. So basically blackness can be this, if it is not just a, another style or something, um, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how you phrased the question. Can you repeat it? I think also Ezekiel was also referring, I mean, I would let him do it, but I think he was also bringing the major and minor into the discussion. Yeah. So how styles could sediment and become uh, what uh, Spinoza would say, uh, acting in favor of coactus, not conatus. So diminishing your affects, not empowering them, not opening them up. 
Sorry, was Spinoza would call the, the diminishing the conatus? No, 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 coactus, the opposite of conatus. Coactus. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But so, so the minor is, uh, like, traditionally, you would have a distinction between style and manner, where, where manner would be some particular variety of something hegemonic. But becoming minor, obviously, is a multiplication of the major. That's why writing in a foreign language within your own language is a way of replicating in a new modality. Um, so there's no end to it. There's no economy to this. Uh, there is an ecology to this. So you can only speak ecologically about styles, not economically. I think that is, uh, that is the key uh, here. Um, yeah. But I still don't remember exactly what the question was. So, <laughs> so, so let, let me uh, jump in here. So um, a couple of things. One is, um, I mean, the, 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 what one might think about even, you know, closed recursive systems as, as, as not simply a kind of uh, folding in on itself or determining a linear kind of determination, but in fact, a kind of uh, spiraling, a temporality, right? A, a temporality that is literally spiraling and, 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 and reconfiguring itself. And no, not maintaining the same exact thing, but in fact, reconfiguring to maintain a, a particular logic, right? And so as, as such, yes, the system may be learning, the system may be unfolding, um, but it's uh, at, at the end of the day, one might say the system, the recursive system of racial capitalism is fundamentally seeking to maintain the, the very interests of capital accumulation at the, at, the, at, the, at the cost of particular bodies, at the cost of, in fact, constituting particular bodies as, as, as um, partially human or subhuman, um, and maintaining the very, the very relation between ra the um, racialized social division of labor and the racialized um, formation of capital in and of itself, as well as power, as we get from um, Anibal Quijano. Um, but I think I think what's important. So in some ways, I'm meeting you, right, with the very notion that I mean, there is a it, there there is a reconfiguring. It's not the it's not maintaining the same. But in fact, what still goes on is a kind of creative mode of recursive systems of um, of capital that seek to maintain the same logic of interest, and so. And, and this fundamentally becomes part of um, what, what is understood as a closed system of, of, of recursion. If that system were opened up, what are the ways in which the indeterminacies of that system could potentially blow up that very mm -hmm. system in and of itself, move toward, put, literally um, disrupt and move toward a kind of alternative worlding, if you will, um, or even to, if, I, if I invoke Fred Moten here, a kind of criminality, a kind of fugitivity. Um, and so, and, and when I'm referring to blackness, I'm really referring to a metaphysics that that has no, it's a kind of an originality that, um, and so I'm thinking about on the one hand, yes, racial capitalism, settler colonialism, um, uh, and, and the ways in which there's racial oppression and violence that conditions the very potentiality for fugitivity, the very potentiality for the creative indeterminacies of black performances, um, and um, and blackness in and of itself. So that's that's that when I refer to blackness, that's what I'm that's what I'm really thinking about and going going after, and how the the very infinite nature of those creative indeterminacies can become a force for trans for maybe transformation is not the right word, but rupturing the system. Wouldn't you say then? Wouldn't you say then? I'm, I'm sorry, Dubin. Sorry, sorry. I cannot control myself. I apologize. Yeah. Wouldn't you, because I'm I'm quite driven by the conversation. But what do you say then with what Ezekiel just said? And given also since and Bruce background, which we can roughly call cybernetic, okay? A background in cybernetics. But then style, what you're just saying, Ezekiel, and cybernetics could also come together in something we can call governmentality, how we govern, how we direct our, our, our design space. And then how would you speak of any kind of norms and values within that? Is there, how would the how would, would we qualify a better way to govern our, our existence than another way? What would that make better? What would be a better way to govern ourselves? Just and to, it's an open question to everyone now. I'm not exactly. Concerned. And just to kind of bring in another voice, which I think it will particularly have something to contribute, Heidi. So you have also probably you could, this kind of minor aspect that we were talking about, see that you have 
a lot in your head right now. So you could definitely comment on what just uh, Stavros mentioned. Well, first of all, I, I totally agree with Ezekiel. I, I, I mean, I feel the, I feel the, the, the potential in that uh, disrupt, the disruptive, uh, uh, yeah, potential of it. So before anything else, before we can even talk about worlding, we need to destroy whatever uh, maintains the status quo. So of course that is, uh, in a sense, uh, the opposite of a, of a sort of a, a entropic, uh, um, uh, uh, can I say, force or economy or flow or something like that. But I really honestly think that this is a discussion or I mean, it's, a, it's a, a, an exchange of words that might be much better suited in the fourth and last domain uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm holding a little bit on my, I'm holding my guns a bit. For okay. Part. So I'm going to repeat the provocation about cybernetic style and governmentality as, as understood in the symbiotic domain, but uh, I'm overstepping all constantly. But, but, but you know what, I, I do think this is a really good uh, overlap because we're seeing here like lines that are starting to touch upon all the domains and that are going to be very difficult to, you know, to curate in a certain way. Oh, this is a, pertains to the so-and-so social journey, or this belongs to the agency discussions or this. So what I'm seeing here, at least from the discussions, which I feel a little bit dumb because all I do is, uh, you know, uh, uh, nod with a lot of excitement, is transversal lines flying everywhere. So the illusion or not, I mean, there's this kind of a, a fireworks of lines of flight that are going all, the, all over the place. So I'm, I'm thinking this book is gonna be incredible. It's, uh, it's gonna be incredible. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, I get the impression Stavros uh, is, is nudging me uh, whether or not that's the case. Of course, the root of cybernetics is the, is the governor, is the concept of governing, but, but how cybernetics develops uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, essentially, uh, I mean, there's a very uh, problematic discourse of uh, uh, of, of the carrying out of these, uh, uh, well, let me get back. The, the, as I see it, where, where, the, where the best discourse of cybernetics arrives is to this autopoietic line of discussion, which has to do with, uh, in, and Varela develops it in, in terms of autonomy. Okay, so that the system governs itself. What, now, and, but of course, he's grounding this at the level of life. And so I can't really, and that's for the moment where I think I can uh, bring something to this discussion with regard to the way that life uh, ramifies upon itself, sort of propagates or, or finds its own style, if you want to put it. So for instance, as I was thinking about what I might possibly say at this uh, uh, symposium today, I was flipping through my Facebook, and uh, and there was this picture of a of a bagworm moth on a twig on a tree, and this is a kind of insect that builds that that builds for itself its own cocoon, in which it will then pupate to become the moth, but. In the, in the caterpillar stage, it saws twigs and then glues them together in a kind of little log cabin. Uh, and then eventually it's going to go into its own little house and transform into, a, into the, the, the imago or the mature form. Uh, and I just, so here's the natural technicity. And this is really where Margulis takes, I mean, in, if I can just kind of blow it out uh, uh, towards the Gaian limit of the autopoiesis concept as Margulis develops it, it's about the interrelation of life and environment. It's about life, that life forms its own environment. Life is designing or collaborating with the materiality of its affordances to find ways to create new niches for itself. It's niche construction. Um, and, and so uh, there's a wonderful article by Dorian Sagan and Margulis uh, published in um, this book here, which I recommend to you, whoa, Dazzle Gradually, okay? Collection of their occasional writings. So it's called The Machines, what's it called here? 
welcome to the machine. But it's really about how life is, is uh, life produces its own technicity by reincorporating its environment and building out its own bodily structures or in building out homes, right? Inorganic spaces for it to occupy as part of its survival strategy. Okay, so there's, um, uh, so that's, that's just one way to, I mean, that's off on a different, uh, I mean, this doesn't touch on the, 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 the incredibly heavy issues of political, geopolitical systems and governmentality that, uh, that we were just talking about, but it, it, it's in the background, I would think, of a sense of, uh, of a general sense that, uh, that our life form <laughs> um, is in need of reintegration with the, with the major, I mean, okay, I'm ju just meaning major in a simple way of that, that the system on this planet by which we are all sustained um, is one that has found over geological time a way to recycle its metabolic processes and the residues of its metabolism, that it reincorporates its waste in the fullness of evolutionary time as a medium in, in which to build new structures. Maybe I can so use this moment to uh, wrap for you. I just, I just wanted to use this moment for a very shameless uh, uh, product placement because uh, we have just published a book uh, on the how the organic is utterly dependent on the inorganic and the title is Architectures of Life and Death. And uh, Greg has written beautiful endorsements and there are quite a few people in the room who have contributed to, to the project. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the subtitle something, if, if, I don't know. Vehicle, 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 vehicle aesthetic and... complete environment. Yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 and, and uh, but I was also wanted to just mention instead of autopoiesis, I think we were pushing in, in the introduction at least for this idea of heteropo heteropoiesis, but I think that's that goes along. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes the auto anymore. <laughs> yes. And I guess um, Shin Wei wants to add yeah. uh, something to that. Please and unmute. Please, still please. Muted. Hi, okay, so I just wanted to collect a few uh, comments that might be uh, fun to add. So um, with, with regard to how recursion was uh, discussed, I was wondering about uh, processuality separately from recursion, just processuality. And um, this is a this quote from Whitehead, uh, which says something like, you know, how an actual entity uh, becomes, constitutes what that entity is, right? Beautiful, compact expression for me, at least of process, notions of process philosophy. So thinking about that, is that when we talk about process, then it's natural to think about languaging, let's say, instead of language, right? It's natural to think in terms of the adverbial, something that Whitehead scholars have mentioned before, right? So thinking of verbs makes us think about adverbs rather than thinking of objects and nouns, which makes us think of adjectives. Very simple way to put it, okay? But this, this way of thinking about manner may be a way to approach the question of style in a non-anthropocentric way. So think of a style in just terms of manner, not mannerism, but manner, right? The manner in which processes happen, okay? So, but throughout this kind of uh, thought, we might try to think about, well, well, let's think about all these questions in a non-anthropocentric way. It's part of that, it's a friendly uh, adjunction to the, the book that you just uh, recommended, I would say, perhaps. Another question, another comment, okay. With regard to closed versus open systems, um, maybe uh, uh, this notion that we can bring forward is this question of indeterminacy, right? So I think that's the interesting, or well, we would say that's an interesting effect when we go to open systems. Closed versus open systems sometimes becomes very hot debate, technical debate. Um, so uh, that, that motivates this question of, um, well, what are some other ways to bring, to, to get to this question of indeterminacy? What are some other qualifications or characteristics? So Stuart Kaufman has written very, um, poetically about that and cogently too about this, right? So thinking about um, most about living systems, evolutionary systems, but also about economic systems. Um, 
noting, for example, that uh, there's always this adjacent possible, which emerges, does not pre-exist the event. It emerges in the course of evolution, right? Uh, and another is uh, is this idea that uh, that that states or even potential states of a system can never be stated in advance, the non-prestatable. Okay, uh, so that blows up that blows apart any of the formal uh, approach to 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 complex systems, actually, uh, mathematical systems. So now, given all that. Uh, uh, there's also this other discussion from, from looking at uh, theories of organism with Giuseppe Longo, right, Emil Monteville, and of course Kaufman. And there's some very useful, I think very fruitful uh, uh, notions. For example, this notion of extended criticality, which links back to Simon Don. Okay. So thinking about maybe living systems are characterized not by just having isolated uh, inflection points. It could go this way, it could go that way, or metastable points. But in fact, those metastable critical points are extended. They're dense. They're always in. There's no region around us in which there's not uh, a, a, a metastable point. So that gives a beautiful, beautiful characterization, maybe not a unique characterization of living systems, that they are always in this metastable condition. Okay, That metastability is dense. It's not an isolated isolate case. So the question we can come back with, and I'll close here, okay, is what kind of systems, maybe systems not the right word, okay, what kind of metabolisms or no, systems um, have that sort of character, the character of non presentability the character of extended criticality, okay? We know that life exhibits this, our notions of life exhibit this, but maybe we can just be a little bit, you know, speculative, say, well, what are the, um, uh, parts of the world uh, in this experience, say experience, okay, um, this blooming confusion of experience that exhibit that kind, those kinds of qualities, okay. So that's just a question. We we'll leave it with that, okay, for now. But I would, I would just like to say that with Dumin and some other people, we've been thinking about well, the manner in which uh, processes happen with those kinds of properties, open-endedness and extended criticality. Maybe we could say it's characterized by a word play. Yeah. Okay, Dominion has more to say about that, I'm sure. And I would like to add to that the question of non anthropocentric play, non, -anthrop non anthropocentric play. Mm -hmm. and, Andre, I would like to give the, 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 the word to you because you can even introduce your favorite example of the cat, why the cat bites you without actually biting you, connecting yeah, it I, to I, the I, non anthropocentric I, play. Mm -hmm. I love that. I also I saw Bruce's cat passing by and I remembered it. That's why. No, I, I appropriate this from uh, directly from Bateson, who says a cat's nip is not a bite. So that means that the cat has the capacity of, uh, uh, I mean, play signifies that it goes, she's not trapped in the vital space. Uh, it can actually ponder what ifs. Uh, and therefore, it has the it expands the uh, the design space to, to to go with the with this uh, uh, the thing that we uh, chose for the title. Uh, we have to imperceptibly slowly move to the fourth tier uh, tier and 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 in video indulgence. Third, 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 sorry, third. Uh, third uh, very tier. briefly, <laughs> yes, third uh, uh, on on uh, uh, radical empiricism. So I will just simply remind all of us. Uh, uh, Yes, oh, thank you for this also, for these wonderful references that we get in the, in the chat. We will save the chat as well. Uh, um, so radical empiricism, there's one line in the introduction uh, with the four, third tier where I think it's most significant when we say that our receptive faculties are themselves the result of design. I find that very exciting. And, and there is a, um, a very helpful uh, list uh, compiled by uh, Masumi uh, where he is uh, trying to compare the uh, the radical empiricism to the classical empiricism, there are five points, but I will single out only three for, for the purposes of this conversation. He says that uh, every, take everything as it comes because you cannot pick and choose according to a priori principles or pre-given evaluative criteria. Then I jump to the fourth one where he says, relations are not only real, but they're really perceived and directly so. And finally, uh, and this is a uh, William James point, 99 times out of 100. So most of the time, uh, we are not actually uh, actual perceivers, but, but virtual perceivers. Which brings me to uh, the idea of, uh, of this uh, generalized pragmatism. Maybe some people would, namely uh, uh, Eric uh, Horl that I mentioned previously, would say that per perhaps, perhaps this could be considered as the third 
uh, stage of cyberneticism, namely generalized uh, uh, generalized ecology. And uh, and uh, I, I have a, I have prepared a lot, but, but for the sake of um, to be very concise and, and, and brief, I just want to touch on something that both uh, Ezekiel and and Shinbei uh, spoke about this idea of overdetermination and determination in general. And I, I want to do this by reference to uh, John Protevi's uh, very helpful uh, uh, concept of granularity. And I think this is a, a, a quintessentially uh, <laughs> ecological uh, uh, issue. And it pops up in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, piece that is, uh, uh, I, I just seen, seen the first draft of it. It's called Under the Dome, the events of January 6th. Uh, and I've seen it elsewhere, but, but this idea of granularity. So this is what he has to say. He says that uh, how far do you go on the, let's say on the, the socio-political ladder without regard for the singularity of the parts, producing a concept or a category that is all too inclusive or uh, what Deleuze would call say too baggy, so all inclusive. Conversely, how far down do you go on the path of individuation before you get bogged down in, in, in mere idiosyncrasies, merely describing the given without asking how the given is given, or if it could have been given otherwise. So what technicities of, of radical empiricism hopefully will tackle now is, 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 this, a, is this notion of, of, of granularity between, and I underscore, between an unmarked universality and its uh, sui generis particularity. So to, to, to get to the right, the right, right granularity, the idea again of, of non-entailment. In uh, I have a, a, a pleasure of, uh, being a, a, a companion, a friend of, of uh, very three people very dear to my, my heart in the room. And I asked the three of them to, to, to join me in, in thinking about this uh, radical uh, empiricism uh, and in relation to technicities. Uh, and namely, this is uh, Agnieszka, uh, who uh, she has already mentioned that now, uh, as of recently, she's into demo demonology and she has produced a wonderful uh, uh, Ask Demonis manifesto, uh, but not just as an author, as a human being, she's also uh, uh, adopting uh, sh shapes shifting. So she's a pot plant, she's a xeno, and she's also a virus in, in this, uh, uh, and perhaps even a cat. Then we have Lila, who uh, is, uh, I already mentioned, uh, she's upgrading the, the Gatarian tree ecologies for the digital age. And, and I'm not determining anything. You can go with whichever way you want. And finally, 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 my friend Mark, with his uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, adopting a strategic anthropomorphism, and he, when he's trying to imagine what is it that that, that media desire. So, in, perhaps in that order, ladies first. I, I would invite Agnieszka to to uh, go first, and, and maybe share with us either something to do with the manifesto or anything you you you'd like to tell us about. Right, this is really difficult because I'm still sorry, in the previous sorry, conversation. Yeska, I, sorry, I'm just gonna say something extremely dumb and practical. Since we decided privately, me and Andre, to not have a break since we have uh, gained speed and uh, yeah, the discussion is moving on. Uh, feel free, everyone, if you need to just go to the toilet or make a coffee, turn off your cameras and yeah, whatever, mute yourself and just go for uh, for a brief time if you want. Okay. We cannot stop now. Yeah, let's let's not stop. So yeah, just do it whenever you want if you want to have a break. Okay, so I'm still in my head in the previous conversation and somehow I'm a little bit stuck on the question of violence. Um, so Ezekiel, I think you just briefly mentioned Fanon, right? And also your first your first comment, yeah, some stuff needs to burn. Um, I was wondering if this somehow <laughs> relates to each other. Uh, but also, the fact that, you know, like um, Short mentioned the multiplicity, right? The mannerism is about the multiplication. But somehow, you know, how to not be trapped or not to fall into complacency in this multiplication, right? So we are so careful not to fall into dialectics, but somehow by not following, by not um, taking maybe the risk of violence, um, we are becoming complacent in the existing violence. 
Um, so this is something that now I'm stuck. <laughs> um, so it would be wonderful if you would talk maybe as a girl more about it or just um, as a remark. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so in my recent uh, um, exploration and experimentation, indeed I'm multiplying, right? I'm multiplying personas. Uh, so the one that I'm multiplying that uh, Andre didn't mention is also a slug. <laughs> Um, and you know, like a slug is an animal, right? Um, that uh, in the agriculture is considered a violent and a pest. And in a way, it's a hybrid. It's uh, it's uh, a dualistic, highly dualistic body. So, I recently discovered that you know, like they they found that a slug can shed the whole body and regrow from just the head. So that would that mean that this is, you know, like a prince of dualism, <laughs> you know, like the body doesn't matter. Um, uh, but somehow, you know, by taking the risk of embodying these multiple personas, imagining the perceptions, but not only in the speculative terms, but actually taking the, the risk of, uh, you know, being complicit, in what they embody, maybe um, allow us to this, um, you know, this worldings that you were also talking about, right? How, how to overcome this dualism between open and closed systems, right? How can we, you know, um, uh, you know, re redesign, uh, but. My question was also, um, oh, this is the cat, <laughs> you wake up. <laughs> um, but also, you know, maybe it's not the question of this, um, dualis this dualism between open and closed, but again, you know, the condition, uh, the question of condition, right? How do, how we condition uh, the open system? Because, you know, of course we are trapped uh, by ideologies, by I call this affectia. So to go back to Gregory, a distinction between you know different affects. So affectia is a state of things, and you know with our bodies and identities, we are constantly trapped and determined by them. So how can we condition the affectus? What what I call the affectus? Um, I will maybe stop here because. Um, you know, let's let's see how this will unravel. Thank you, thank you, Agnieszka. Let's go, Lila. Would you care to okay, continue? Yeah, I will also pick up on tangents, and I have to say the upgrade to the three ecologies that you mentioned. I was thinking of mentioning more during the minor technicities of like the getting rid of the obstacles that Ezekiel mentioned, also the kind mm -hmm. of like setting fire. I was, um, in terms of uh, the kind of framing of this domain, let's say, what I was interested in is the um, uh, kind of like the habits, the same habitats that in turn uh, shape habits, this kind of reciprocity that is implied that brings up questions of uh, like agency, again, going back into the minor technicities of like who is designing and the access of mm -hmm. a human for what. Uh, but also trying to relate that to kind of Ezekiel's work in, ge in general on the temporal framing of space. So thinking of rec uh, recursivity, temporality and sequencing and trying to see the kind of like role of design or the role of architecture within it. Uh, like reading the kind of the briefing of the book, I was thinking of like the different um, concepts of design that came out like throughout my life from beginning from when I was like doing still architecture and you have a, a very specific framing of design to now that I'm uh, dealing with design also basically on like social policy or dealing more with like law let's say mm -hmm. so I was thinking of this kind of like two different temporalities on one side you have the urban design architecture which is kind of fundamentally strategic in its role and the temporality kind of fixes for a specific time frame and the aim is mainly to codify or at best like re-territorialize certain habits and practices and on the other hand you will have another kind of design space that is more tactical rather than strategic 
and just give mm -hmm. like a concrete example that kind of relates both design in terms of spatial design, but also in terms of like thinking policy is um, presently, like at this moment, there is a dissertation on the parkscape in the fine arts uh, department here at the Peace Bar, which is like facilitated by what we call tactical occupation architecture. Uh, and this is an action framed or rather disguised as a performance holding a pro-Palestine banner that is in itself an intervention that utilizes the loophole in the policy that you cannot place a banner, but you can hold it in place with your hands. Um, or like to give another example of this kind of like tactical design is uh, finding the elbow room that you mentioned in the brief within like policies and legislations and design regulations to allow people to stay in their uh, homes for as long as possible after they get the eviction letter. And that are different types of reiterated Reterritorialization that are like they work on it like a different temporality than like urban design and architecture does. Um, and something that comes along with this is like the premise that you think that tactical design or this kind of design is always a response to strategic design or to like mm -hmm. policy, etc. But um, I think of it more like the other way around that strategic design is a response to kind of more like tactical design that tries to anticipate and preemptively like deter like the tactical resistance. Um, and I guess then like preemptiveness also relates to discussion around like uh, what we mentioned before, algorithmic governmentality and uh, informational toxicities and the strategies that come at play there. So I think I will leave it here and then perhaps intervene more on the minor technicities. Thank you so much, Lila. Perhaps this this is very close to what I meant by this term quasi causality. The the, the 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 technical level, the strategic level, the infrastructural level, logistics, and the tools, and how how is it that they, you know, kind of produce a, a certain kind of causality. And now the one and the only, my friend Mark, from directly from Amsterdam. <laughs> I talk about priming. Well, this can only be a disaster. Um, just <laughs> just picking up on the uh, the remark about uh, the cat's play. Uh, I, you, you have nothing seen, uh, you, you didn't see anything yet until you see an octopus play. So my octopus teacher is the film for you uh, to, to, to take into the next step of it. And of course, I was, I was mesmerized by the discussion so far. So I have made so many notes that I would like to tie everything together and then we can have a coffee. But I think that is not the purpose of today. Of course, I was uh, most uh, intrigued by uh, Cochrane's uh, um, opening with the uh, mountains of uh, Cezanne, because uh, in my little brief, we uh, refer to the creation of modalities of sub subjectivity as an analogy to the, uh, the way that an artist uh, creates new forms from the palette. And then, of course, the first thing is to ask yourself, what is this pen palette? I mean, it's a finite kind of operation because it doesn't suggest that it is a real open system in that sense because the palette is only consisting of the colors that we can actually see so whatever is made out of that will still be visible for those who uh, who, who make and see this and then of course that also ties into the question who makes this palette where does it come from and then of course it becomes very interesting if you take this uh, notion of information as a production and consumption of meaning because then there is a sort of a, an axis being created in the meaning um, ranging from, let's say, forward meaning creation, like the, the Bader Meinhof effect, where you only see the things that are primed in your mind, which in the top of your head, to what you mentioned in your opening to the creation of memory, uh, which is, of course, a very thin part of all futures that have been created at the point, which ties in, of course, also. Uh, to the discussion of, uh, let's say, the minor history as such. I mean, what is it in fact in your memory? How does it relate to your Bader Meinhof in, in the mind? But coming back to these pictures, uh, these, these paintings, I mean, I was not so much interested in what happens to the mountains, but of course, what is being produced uh, if you spend your whole career on, on painting uh, this, the same topic and producing a, a large volume of the same image, this image becomes in itself also a mountain. This is this is not just this one image. It it has been recorded. So uh, there is a sort of it, it's it's a self-referential system of con contextualization of the next picture vis-a-vis -vis the last picture vis-a-vis -vis the original one, which is 
non-existing in this sense. And of course, being at Cezanne, also the second part kicks in of commodification, because now, of course, this is not an innocent picture anymore. Maybe this is also tying a little bit to what Agnieszka talks about this this violence, because you could argue is is, is non-innocence the same as uh, violence, but in a sense it is, because we are talking here on a deeper level of violence, not the obvious, or, uh, obviously. So my first suggestion would be, if we burn something, let's burn the pictures of the Cezanne. Let's start over. Let's start with the mountain <laughs> and not have this tree or this array of, of, of references in there. And then, of course, this whole question of whose memory, what is the memory, how does this tie in with anticipation and, and, and perception? Uh, this is also a designing process in itself. And I think this is, the, this is of course, the layer that we want to tap into. Um, I was also, by lack of knowledge, I refer to him as Bruno because I forgot your name, my apologies. Um, the, for me, let's say the, the opposition of life in an environment uh, goes a little bit astray, especially when you talk about a biological environment, because then again, the question is, whose life are you referring to? And then uh, that becomes an interesting uh, discussion, as we have seen, when you shift this from the anthropocentric to the non-anthropocentric uh, uh, play. So to, to, sort of, to sort of tie it together, um, I would say that this, 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 this information seen as meaning is in itself, if we accept this, is already a political act, obviously, because what make meaning, where is it, uh, where, where does it stand? Because this information is, especially when you tie it to what is a medium itself, a medium can be you know, defined as, as, as something which can carry information over time, over uh, distance. Uh, then it's also the question of who releases what at what moment, and also what meaning is attached to this. Uh, so um, I would be very interested to see, because for some reason, and I think this is also a very good reason <laughs> and a good tendency, all the discussions now uh, sort of have led us to the last one, where this minor technicity becomes the, the big let's say, the, 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 the node where everything comes together, because whatever definition you put on top of the given, uh, it is already a political one. So there you go into a sort of a, a stream of assumptions or creations, expectations. And um, so I would be really interested to see if we can draw in also more voices in the, in the last round of this discussion, because I think that, uh, especially because it's the fourth one, it can also connect more of the elements previously mentioned, but I can see clearly the tendency to to do, to discuss that. Uh, so for that reason, I would like to stop. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mark and, and Bob. No pressure. So <laughs> pick, pick it up. <laughs> was that the no pressure was a put the pressure on button or? <laughs> <laughs> well. I think the the way that Mark just phrased it is exactly that. Now, so it's like the the how these things come together, how so that they construct basically a locus in which this design space is formed. You no, know? and that how that comes together, of course, also involves to place that process in a material milieu, which is actually reconfiguring this space. You no, know? so and I think one of the very first things that I want to bring in there, and uh, so to say. Uh, from my own positionality is exactly that that how it comes together from my minor perspective as a queer theorist is that that happens as multiple hows in multiple and very different convergences. Um, so like in the in the previous discussions that we touched on some of these points where there's maybe some sort of a universalization going on. And I think that also uh, relates back to Agnieszka's questions, like how do we not fall into uh, dualisms there or in either or scenarios, but um, a proliferation of uh, differentiations that actually creates specific uh, design spaces and specific uh, virtual processes there. And so that's my personal fascination with, let's say, extending assemblage theory a little bit through, let's say, not just post-human and new materialist angles, but also, let's say, particular queer feminist and decolonial perspectives that not all assemblages are created equal, uh, not all sympoeses are creating equal. 
Um, and that actually means that um, it cannot start from a simple differentiation process, but it has to start with a complexification of these differentiatings and differentiatings that happen in this process. And therefore, I thought it would be interesting to problematize these minor perspectives, not as a universal uh, positionality, but precisely in their uncountable differences. And one of these things to maybe group them would then, of course, through marginalized uh, or historically marginalized positionalities and the intersections at which these particular processes, where th people are basically locked into particular systems, uh, unfolds. And therefore, it becomes much more visible. So in this, like as, as the poster said, I wanted to basically use this as a platform to problematize basically by taking up some of these critiques, who is designing and determining or creating spaces of possibilities um, and who gets to be charged with that. And then just as a means of, let's say, a statement of accountability, there is a lot of people that we have tried to invite to participate in that position, but who didn't have the time um, or finances uh, to, to join us here. And uh, I will name them uh, just uh, because they haunt this discussion, as Ezekiel would say, on there's here with us in spirit. But for example, offices like uh, Johannesburg, uh, the Johannesburg-based office counter space, who precisely maps these kind of differentiation processes, how people deal with reconfigurations of spaces of possibilities and flows, would have been perfect uh, to enrich this discussion, for example, or uh, somebody like an agency like Forensic Architecture that uh, investigates, for example, ecocide right now in, in Gaza, for example, um, or, or other kind of things. What I want to say is basically that we have talked a little bit about these interdisciplinary positions, but maybe the intersectional approaches or even critical extensions of intersectional approaches would put a much more clear focus on that, let's say, the way that design spaces always foster a particular kind of life. Uh, but then people uh, like Ashil Mbembe would, of course, counter that this fostering is always lined by processes that destroy uh, other forms of life. Or Sarah Ahmed would probably say that the more one path is walked, the more one path is walked, and therefore more other paths are systemically gridlocked and uh, prevented from coming into existence. So scholars like Catherine Yusuf, Jill Cassett, Jasper Poir, Paul Preciado would have all highlighted that these matrices of oppression basically intersect and they play together in let's say these kind of systemic processes and this layering of these uh, is a particular layer level of complexity level of organizational complexity that has to be addressed at base for how this design space is constructed what i think is important and what we have also touched on in the discussion before is that we at the same time need to post humanize the very question who is designing because with stiegler who argues that it's the what that determines the who. So it's a kind of a context that creates specific kind of subjectivities. It's not a who that actually creates the uh, say spaces of possibilities, but it is a situation that uh, in some sense unfolds in itself. And I think uh, that, for example, the, the what the, that would lead the problematic to what is this space of intersecting possibilities and how are they connected to these uh, matrices of oppression? And I think maybe one point to enter this discussion is uh, Ezekiel's uh, discussion, for example, because you have, for example, understood the entire uh, your entire idea, I think, is very interesting because you uh, um, employ Alexander Vehelia's idea about hierarchizing assemblages, you know, so that these things cannot be understood from processes of racialization, genderization, and so on. And all the that differences are always made. It's just a matter of, let's say, how these differences are made, you no, know, and what they actually what they lead into. And I think if you if you could elaborate that precisely um, a little bit and. I think it would also be very interesting if you could elaborate how you read that through Barat, particularly as a diffracting setup. Wow, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bob. This is it's very um, generative thoughts and, and, and provocative as well. Um, so I'm gonna try to 
comment on a couple of things, including what you, including racializing assemblages and thinking diffraction, um, thinking racializing assemblage even via Barad's diffraction, but also try to also answer, uh, I think it's Anyechka's um, uh, uh, question of reg regarding violence and, um, uh, oh gosh, and burning. Uh, excuse me, violence and, and, and letting it burn. Um, so, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, I, I think I might start with, um, it's, I, I almost want to underscore what Jazz Beer Poir offers for us with regard to the um, utility of assemblage theory and thinking intersectionality, right? I mean, in some ways, I think oftentimes, I, I think she's, she's been misread to be just trying to write off intersectionality. Um, uh, but in fact, what I read uh, Jasbir to be doing is trying to think about how assemblage theory places a particular lens and focus on the event and the various, and, and literally the necessity to mind the relationships, the arrangements, the organization, and the forces that bring that, event, that event into emergence which shifts the lens from what has often been the slippage of intersectionality onto identity and position. And what um, even what Masumi would characterize as those coordinates in, in, in a plane, in, in, a, in a processual plane, if you will. Um, and rather focusing on what are the processes that bring this event into emergence? What are those forces that bring this event into emergence that then make up the very interpolative um, I, I byproducts, we might say, of, of, of identities and positionalities, right? And so this makes it much more, that, that lens just to, to make it much more about also arguably power, right? So if we, if we really think about power as a process um, and not this kind of static thing, a, a static system for that matter, then it fundamentally will shift our way of thinking about how to go about the very material discursive even analysis of power in uh, of power relations and in, in into events, and so then I'm yeah then I'm uh, you know of course I'm I, I find myself um, quite taken by Alex Bahillier's take up of assemblage theory, but in relation to black radical feminists such as Sylvia Winter and Hortense Spillers um, and and others, right? And so really to think about how racializations is really not simply to be understood as a, uh, the, the byproduct of, of racialized difference, but in fact, a system of sociopolitical relations that is a force that produces difference in and of itself in the ways in which they are folding in on, them, on, on one another. Um, and I think that um, there's a way in which I'm, I wanna make this connection actually to racial capitalism here. Um, and the notion of violence and burning. Because in fact, one might think about that very sociopolitical system as fundamentally racial capitalism, and even more broadly, as I spoke about earlier, blackness, right? A, a very system, a very even metaphysics, we might say, that is of racial capitalism, that is, that is, um, that is about um, racial violence and subjugation. And so that, and, and, if we think about this in relation to recursive techno-social systems, what's fundamentally necessitated is the racial violence and subjugation in order to maintain the monologic universal of the system, the very monologic universal of, a, of, of particularly a, 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 Euro, a Eurocentric hegemony as, as um, Annabel Quijano will point to. Um, and th that seeks to, in fact, does a dual move. On the one hand, it seeks to actually push the, the system toward entropy, while at the same time positioning technology to fundamentally be the very savior of that system, right? So technology, technical social systems are fun functioning and doing both these, this, this kind of dual motion, pushing it toward entropy because what does that do? It actually fundamentally brings about the accumulation of capital. It forms capital, while at the same time positioning technology to be the savior of the system. Well. What does that then mean for violence and burning? So violence is happening on the one hand to maintain the monologic universal while at the same time, um, you best believe that there's refusal, that there's fugitivity, that there are lines of flight. Um, and even to, to invoke Edward Glissant's 
rerouting, and even air injuries, right? And so what I mean by letting it burn is push that, ent that entropic condition beyond the limit, push it to the apocalypse, because what's fundamentally needed is for the system to burn down in order to create anything, to imagine anything else. Um, may, I provoke, may I provoke you and ask you how would that relate if it does with accelerationism? Um, I, I actually, I would say it's very much so related to what even um, has, uh, of course, I'm blanking on their name right now. Oh my gosh, sorry. Black accelerationism, right? A very particular form of, of accelerationism that is focused on um, uh, the very forces of, of, of racial capitalism and the necessity for blowing the very worlding system up. I... I, I I feel like there might be something I'm not that I'm missing, but let me know if I did not touch on something, Robert. Now, I think the, the interesting thing is, of course, that you say there is the, the mono technology that you basically take from Hui, like the critique of, um, let's say, the, the dominance of one particular understanding of techniques is, of course, very much backed up by, for example, uh, uh, Winter's um, uh, or uh, McKittrick's idea about like foregrounding practices, no, because they're more about like it, it foregrounds is actually the deconstruction of one specific kind of man or the Western man as the brand, you no, know, in favor of other worlding practices that involve different cosmopolitics and therefore, or a, 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 therefore dif different cosmotechnics that leads to what Cadenia and Blaza would call like a world of many worlds that, in a sense, uh, are on, on a more uh, on the same level. And I think maybe your critique would be clear if you basically quickly, how to say, summarize your core argument that how, for example, this possibility that is limited is in a sense inherited through, through these recursive systems. So, I mean, that's your base critique that they say you cannot, you cannot just adapt within the given structure. Um, because the structure is already so biased by repeated uh, forms of colonial logic that there cannot be anything in the system. And I think that would, um, that, that would make it clear why you say that system has to collapse in itself. That, that, in, in short, yes, that's precisely, I think, precisely right. I mean, in, in, in my first book was on inheritance and, and, and literally thinking about the ways inheritance becomes the very process of social reproduction. and. And even how I'm even now getting now toward recursive recursivity, um, uh, but I also realized so diffraction is literally working through how we how the very interfering mechanisms of the social world, um, and how those very interfering mechanisms of the social world are actually are, are on the one hand functioning to do the work of recursively enfolding and compressing, mm. um, but also producing, producing a, in uh, the, the very, uh, and I'm going to invoke um, Bates in here, the very differences that make, the, make that make a difference, so the very potentiality. I think what would be interesting is, and I think I would to put you in a discussion there maybe with Lucia, um, because I say in, in, in that text you basically argue, and also in the, in the diffractive uh, onto-epistemologies that you argue, you argue that, let's say, you cannot just talk about exclusionary practices if you don't understand how these things are perpetuated or inherited within the system, and therefore you say they are maintained by inherited onto-epistemological phyla. No, and I think that's very interesting in, in consideration how, how Lucia uh, looks at the rebel bodies and what kind of elbow room you can do by dissenting within the system no, and, and in a sense navigating. Uh, let's say, because in a sense, we, you cannot take yourself out from the system. No? So you have to have that imminent position that the system has to be in a sense reworked from within. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I was, in fact, thinking as, as Segel was, uh, you were talking uh, about this uh, burning the, the, the system down. And uh, is it true that the, the question of, of, the, of the rebel, I, I, I picked precisely because there is an affirmative uh, notion within it. So it's not 
uh, resisting position. So it's it's not assuming that the power is there and I react to it. So that what Lila also uh, mentioned before, no, this kind of um, there is a lot of uh, developments focus on resisting architectures or resisting designs, resisting practices, which in the end uh, are defined by that to which they are uh, resisting instead of the affirm affirmative action, <laughs> creativity, uh, and, and negotiation with the real that, that comes with, uh, with uh, rebellion. No? Mm. So I'm interested in the question of, of the negotiation uh, and the accords, no? because that, um, that conflict between uh, different realities, between different systems, between the major and the minor, between all these um, entanglements, uh, I think there is no uh, resolution. It's, 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 I see it more as a question of keeping always the battlefield on, no? <laughs> active. And understanding that that conflict needs needs to be reopened every time and renegotiated every time. No, and there is this term of of um, in Spanish we use it a lot. Acuerdo in in English I, I think it sounds a bit weirder. The accord is not so much used to to talk about the negotiation, but its origin uh, in the end it's it's making the 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 two heartbeats of different people. Uh, follow a, a, an echo in rhythm between them, no? So it's it's about adjusting uh, temporalities, but not uh, without eliminating any of them, because precisely there is no way of eliminating anything. The, 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 all that conflict is going to be to be there uh, again. So I think it's uh, yeah, it's key to bring that conflict everywhere, and that's something that I. Um, I've always had a, po a weird position where I've touched upon questions of theory, but I keep uh, practicing even if it's through the university and doing projects and trying to work with, with uh, officials and with uh, politicians and with citizens and seeing how we can precisely uh, work and inhabit uh, that conflict. No? So I think I, I, what, what you also highlighted and also in your, let's say in your enthusiastic email response you already pointed to the fact that for you this is very much related to Gattari's notion of asignifying semiotics no and I think that would be maybe a good moment to bring that back because what you argue is that a rebel body has to in a sense carefully navigate a milieu no and therefore there is this kind of transductive relation between your own becoming and the the habitat that the habits adapt no so like this uh, the three ecologies that Lila brought in there. No? So what it actually does with, let's say, Stiegler or Hurl is that it effectuates a trans-individuation, no? like this kind of mutual becoming between who you are becoming while engaging in the transformation of a particular habitat. And I think that, for example, I personally take that as a very interesting reading of what architecture, for example, does. No? Like, how do you become an architect? How do you become a designer that, in a sense, navigates these spaces of possibilities along which you become while also, in a sense, constructing, reconstructing the world and reconfiguring? But I think that, that you, what you mentioned, like the, the modality in which you engage with that, I think in Lila's case, you know, the way that you disidentify, in a sense, from being an architect and disidentify with, a, say, chiming into these existing structures, I think is a very interesting process for your own becoming within this process, no? That was referring to me or Lucia? Both of you, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's disidentifying in a way, it's more of like appropriating certain aspects of that identity and moving it to the rest, because it's always this I, I mean, I think by like occupying different uh, territories and different identities, let's say, you can also do like the Trojan horse thing, you know, because it, it, it is a it is a, um, a question of power. For example, if I did indeed have a law degree, I would have like way more power to help the people that I'm like working with or to like support communities uh, that like we're trying to support. But it's like using how do you like reappropriate skills and kind of your position and in order to like redistribute this um, yeah 
like redistribute like the power that you have. I think there, it's. Uh, I think also connecting to what uh, Agnieszka was saying now of the being multiple personas. No, I think um, this kind of of uh, minor practice has to do a lot with building a certain invisibility or playing with the visibility and invisibility mm -hmm. uh, game because it's true that uh, for instance in architecture we are focused on okay we are going to represent this space we are going to analyze things by representing them so making them visible and even if we think of how their repertoire uh, so the kind of, of practical memory that we have is built through uh, representation images that more and more are, are becoming more like uh, hits, uh, sensorial hits, they, 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 they have lost any kind of that, that meaning that we were discussing at the beginning. So I think there is also something to think there, no, of, of this kind of, of clandestinity, of building also invisibilities, of building practices that do not need to be exposed, that do not need to be uh, constantly uh, offered to, to view, but uh, understanding that there are uh, other sensorial ways of creating this, these negotiations that I think have uh, a big power. No? And, and in fact, I think for architecture, we are constantly thinking of making visible objects, but if we think of, of clandestine practices of camouflage, of uh, disguises, of all these uh, kind of interfering with the, with the visible has, has a lot of potentials to go through. Within uh, Alice, uh, how do you how do you do that for your students so that they actually learn to take off the head of let's say the representational thinker and that they conceive first of themselves as you know like situating this, themselves within a particular context that they can transform? Do you have any kind of pedagogical exercises for the students to learn to minoritize themselves? Uh, in Alice, my, my role is mainly as a researcher. So okay. uh, we are next year, we will start to, to play on these topics with, with the students. So, so we can keep that, that discussion open. But it's true that also with the, within research, what we are trying to do is to bring in uh, th this notion of, of, uh, of the science, of how do we work with this science, and also the notion of reads. So uh, precisely something that unsettles the line and where the, the line starts to, to work in a different way. And of course, there the, all the work around the, 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 the diagram, more from a philosophical point of view and, and the lesion than, than the architectural one, which has been more uh, reductive. It's, it's always useful, but um, we, we haven't uh, had the time yet uh, to focus on that, but it's a super nice question. Otherwise, I would maybe ping the question forward to Heidi, because I know that's, of course, also one of your principal didactic aims. Well, not, not really sure that I'm going to answer to that uh, exactly, <laughs> uh, but more, more of a global, uh, a global uh, thought process that I've been having here. What I find incredibly exciting about this last uh, domain that we, we've been discussing is precisely the how. So we're, we're getting into some sort of, a, um, sure, the spaces of possibility, but then how, if, we, if what we need to do is not only resist and struggle against a system or against a hegemony or against a power structure, but we're already starting to think on the how, right? Uh, including uh, the who's that are not uh, precisely and, and exclusively human, but inhuman elements and inhuman uh, units and so on. Uh, it becomes incredibly exciting. Because, um, what I'm thinking right now is that that if we follow uh, Felix Catari and his uh, invitation for uh, an ethical aesthetic paradigm, as one of the points that uh, that he makes very importantly, and I think incredibly uh, relevant today, uh, to imagine those spaces of possibility as the yet to come, as these people yet to be formed, as in in many sense as the way forward. Uh, we need to really talk about agencies. We need to talk about accountabilities. So as creative instances, as architects, as planners, as designers, as thinkers, we create uh, uh, objects, we create things, and we need to take that stance of accountability to the things that we create. 
So I'm thinking in terms of how we design, like how we show students to not resist and struggle, uh, but rather to take a stand back and think what other methods, what other tactics, what other, um, perhaps what other uh, logics there are for, um, for us as uh, designers in that sense of, 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 uh, of creative instances to subvert and undermine uh, and re-undermine and undermine it to the point of, of exhaustion, uh, uh, these uh, relations that are oppressive in a sense and that create this uh, difference that we have been speaking of, something has to change. And uh, the burning metaphor I love, for me, there's nothing more uh, precise than the burning metaphor of exhausting uh, anything, you know? So we'll burn it. So it's the stark delusionism in a way. But on the other hand, it is also the, the, the idea of the anarchism that is involved in the burning the system down. So I think now, uh, perhaps due to the lockdown and so, I have had three or four very interesting uh, theses uh, by students who are dealing with questions of anarcho-aesthetics. So what tended to be like all struggles and the marginal groups and so on, now it becomes like what I'm seeing at least, and I feel really reassured by it, is an interest on not the political per se, but the, the ethical aesthetic aspects of other forms uh, of governmentality, other forms of self-governance in a sense, that, um, that uh, I think uh, changes the entire plateau of what we're, we're dealing with. So I'm thinking very much these ideas of, uh, of mediation. So Lucia, I really love the, the, the ideas of camouflage, the ideas of uh, invisibility, perhaps to, tending towards these ideas of imperceptibility, to truly losing the identity in the way to, to becoming, um, as a way of uh, airing Manning's, the politics of immediation, right? So moving away from this kind of, oh, it's a political issue, it has to do with governmentality and so on, and moving towards uh, other forms of, uh, of uh, let's say, ethical aesthetic um, uh, methods and tactics and modes and uh, in thinking ways. Um, so I'm, I'm having trouble to breathe normally because I'm really excited by all, these, uh, by all these discussions and all these ideas that have been laid out because it seems to me now paramount to do something with this, right? So we can talk about a lot about, uh, you know, the contents of it, but we need to be able to also think of an action plan of some sort of the how, not only the who's and the when's and the where's, but the entirety of these minor questions um, that, uh, that I think are involved in all these uh, really interesting positions. So I'll hold my piece now, but uh, I'm really inspired by this. Uh, I really want to go and burn it down. <laughs> But I think what you also it it creates like this burning desire you know, to bring back what's uh, what stuff was mentioned in the beginning. You know? So like it in in a sense like we have transduced ourselves with let's say the fire in some sense. No, but and I think the interesting thing um, maybe to to at, at one more point in there is I think that we have also through that kind of transductive mechanism and that because of this triadic relation you no know, because it's a threefold transductive relationship there is no dualism possible therefore there is no simple mapping of this means that because these elements are co-constitutive you no know, environmental ecologies social ecologies and mental ecologies are co-constitutive and they produce a trans individuation that in a sense depends on how each of these system is configured no? and i think what it does also in regards to heidi's work it, it steers away all these questions from like taking simple power structures in this kind of hetero heterotopic heterotopological idea of this design space oh we just have to configure it right and then everything will be fine into this very idea about that this what the, what does this design space do you no know? and we had that kind of just base idea, and I think we have touched on that on a multiple level uh, today, is that what it does is it modulates becomings, you know, and therefore it produces difference qua difference. Therefore, it's not about heterotopology, it's about heterogenesis. You no, know, it's about uh, how these things become different. I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, this, this needs to be stressed over and over and over again. It's not about heterotopias or anything like that. If anything, it is about the thought from the outside that's heterogenesis mm. the, the, no like it's a machinic heterogenesis so that's where this entire thing becomes systematic and therefore let's say stiegler's idea of that we need to arrive at a pharmacology or as Simonon would say a mechanology of understanding what is this what happens here in these kind of transductive relations is really urgent to address how 
the transformation of spatial relations creates a difference that matters, that matters in social uh, forms, that matters in, in the mental uh, becomings and so on. And therefore this old idea that these things are in a sense autonomous and have nothing to do with each other and they should be kept separate in separate disciplines, I think is the moment where in a sense this convergence creates the need to actually have that discussion right now. What does it do, but for whom, in what way? No, that without generalizing it. And I think... And when we don't do it, what are the consequences? So be very, very aware of where in what kind of a, a, um, what kind of a uh, system we are, we're operating. So by, by not tackling this, we're also being silent, uh, you know, uh, 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 accomplices to this uh, situation. But there... I have a problem with the burning. Yeah. Okay, Andre, say. say I just want to say perhaps this is the right, this is probably the best moment to include our audience, uh, patient people who are waiting for their turn uh, on that note. But please go ahead, finish your thought, please. No, 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 no. I don't want to overuse my, my, my and, and I would, I would now, I would, uh, Bob, do you mind? I mean, shall we move on? Time-wise, we, we are getting to the point where we should open it up. Uh, and I, I want to acknowledge that, uh, uh, I mean, I, actually, I want to invite people to turn on their cameras and, and, and use this opportunity again, uh, 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 a friend of mine is in the audience and she has, she's just about to defend this wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, is it mirrored or you can, no, it's uh, I'm addressing also, we, can see it. we can see it normally, yeah. You can see it. I'm addressing also the editors in the room because this is a, a, a gem. This is something to get your hands on before uh, somebody else uh, uh, does. Uh, so uh, Renske, can I ask you to just show your face and, and, and uh, announce it, please, please do. I'm putting it on the spot. <laughs> You're muted, Renske. Unmute, unmute. You are in. You yes. Hear. Yes. Well, announce it. I would just say everybody is welcome to listen in. That's the ideal yes. situation of you know hybrid PhD defense means that everybody can join in. Uh, so I can put the. Uh, oh, you're showing the. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, anybody interested on the how? And the importance of the how, uh, working on tactics inspired from Japanese practice. Um, you're welcome to join. Yeah, I'm not going to say more. That's, uh, 24 of June, Yeah. Thursday, early in the morning, because we have a Japanese professor who will be um, joining us. Yeah. So. I like I like Bruno's comment, Bruce's comment about fire being healthy for forests. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I said I'm not going to overuse, but uh, I always overuse, so I'm going to overuse. Uh, and uh, connecting to what Bruce just said, uh, and why I would have a problem with the fire uh, or the burning, not a problem per se, but uh, still, when you want to burn something, you need to know where you start from, and you need to know how to maintain the fire and where where also to direct it. And uh, I don't know if that's, the, if that's the question of the how in general, and uh, that's what's to be addressed. I was going to jump on Robert when he was asking the who is designing, but he did it for himself. He said the what produces the who, who eventually designs. I would even problematize that further and say that the how or the style, the manner, produces the what, who eventually produces the who. And so the where and the when, and the, you know, yeah, of course, it's a minor. It's a minor but 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 I mean I, I suppose for everyone also including people in the audience who should just be disrespectful and not shy and just speak their minds for everyone there might be different terms popping up for me what popped up today unexpectedly a bit was uh, was uh, it's not even a concept it's it's a very practical term and it's value okay um, eventually in 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 issues of metastability like uh, Sin was describing in even the gay and issues of uh, Bruce's uh, work uh, or neo cybernetics. Eventually, when a system in its design space transforms or individuates, it does so both contingently, but also for some reasons, okay? What are these reasons that bring the future state in contact with the present? Perhaps that's what we could call value, because things don't happen just randomly. There is some, some things that motivate action and motivate individuation. And I think in, a, in one way or another, at least that's what I'm getting from it, that's one of the main concerns running throughout all the topics addressed today and the, to the discussions today. How, how is value produced and not only produced, but how it's intuited as well. Sense, sense, sense and, and the directionality you, you're talking about. 
and I would go and make my last very broad jump and even claim that, and I haven't thought that very, very carefully, that one could understand design, even in the term design space, as a simultaneous process of intuiting values and producing norms. So design in an instance both intuits values to bring the future in contact with the present, and also the moment that something is designed is producing a norm, it's producing a habit. It's producing a way that things are done. So it's it's a constant process of folding and unfolding this relation. And uh, let's open it up really. Let, let's ask, invite people who have not had a chance to, 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 to uh, talk. Uh, anybody, please uh, uh, don't be shy. You could also type your questions, I guess, if you don't want to ask it directly, but I mean, you're more than welcome to um, switch the video on and have a live conversation with whichever speaker you want to talk to. So. I, I hope we can save this chat because no, it's, it's now it's gonna, it's gonna full be of wonderful references. I, I guess we can do that. It's going to be saved by default automatically. Don't worry. Yeah. But since I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to fill in the gaps and I would like to bring it a bit to what Gokan was referring in the beginning or, or, or what Gokan is interested in general. Uh, when Bruce mentioned the, the caterpillar example, uh, which is a, I think Gokan is a nice example to include in future articles of yours about your, your uh, heterarchical understanding of architecture. Um, how could one, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to again insert the, 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 the notion of value in there, could one speak about, about value in the sense of how the caterpillar deci decides, doesn't really decide, but individuates and also includes in, in, this, in this way its environment as well in its individuation. How could we, in other words, de-ideologize value, you know, or depoliticize it in the traditional understanding of politics? Not as good and bad anymore. Not as morality in that sense. I would I would ask Gokan that, but if Gokan doesn't want to respond, it's also fine for anybody else. But uh... Perhaps also one way that Bruno might be able to touch on that is actually where the way in which um, Maturana goes into the notion of conservation in the niche and a kind of the, his reading of value, which then goes into you know, the idea of biological design, which has been picked up by people like, I would say, Escobar, uh, Arturo Escobar and his like new idea of the pluriverse. I mean, he refers to Maturana and Varela in a certain sense, I guess. Well, not perhaps not in the exact way that um, Stavros pitched it, which I think is interesting, this contrast. So I guess what um, Bruno might be able to do is kind of give an outline of that and how that may or may not relate to what Stavros <laughs> said. <laughs> Actually, I'd much rather hear you discourse uh, on these matters in which you're, you're more deeply read than me. I was, I, I, you know, I, at the moment, I'm, I'm really absorbed into a Margolisian frame and in, in which value, I mean, the, the, the basis of value has to be the, the uh, uh, you survive, <laughs> you, 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 you create the conditions for your own continuation. Now, this is, the, uh, I mean, there are many levels at which, uh, uh, this can be taken up, but and what I'm hearing in this conversation is, I mean, the point is, if we don't burn it down, we're not going to survive what we've currently got, or what what we've currently got is going to kill us, uh, uh, and and so it needs to be resisted, um, and, and it's hard not to uh, agree with that. Uh, looking, you know, from from any kind of reasonably cogent planetary perspective. Uh, uh, so the, uh, but, but the symbiotic, just to bring it back to the, the theme that was given, the symbiotic has to do with the, with the higher survival value of, of collaboration and cooperation and integration and relation um, and finding the connections that hold uh, 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 as as uh, you know, effectively as possible, but these are always going to be minor events. Uh, at uh, you know, from the perspective of any sort of universality, they're they're going to be holding patterns, uh, 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 and and so 
the um, uh, yeah. So it's a non non zero sum game uh, with, with this idea of sim simpoesis. No, mm -hmm. I, I think well, uh, short has. Maybe go on, Robert. Bob, Bob please go. On. I, I wanted to maybe respond to that because I think one of the interesting things is like if if we extend this idea about let's say endosymbiosis, no, to a kind of technological level with Stiegler, we could say that well, that system that has historically been constructed has already been quite destructive for the majority of the planet, and we face the moment where, so to say, the West becomes enveloped by the same system that consumes the planet since forever. No, so it has something to do with let's say Simon Dor in terms of like a systemic integration where we are now say integrated into the very system that we have so to say created for an anthropogenesis as as you so would say you no know, in order to actually protect us as Ezekiel argues you no know? so like in 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 this kind of dichotomic process but which in a sense turns now uh, and envelops us and swallows us up and I think that in a sense is very interesting in terms of let's say that the that the symbiosis or the the sim technogenesis as one could call it has also a dysbiotic side to it and I think that's what Agnieszka has highlighted a lot so that we have to account for or as Stavos always says the the what, what's your favorite thing with the bunny and the bacteria if you're if you're not if you're, if you have a bunny that's infected by bacteria and you give it antibiotics, you're nice to the bunny, but you're nasty to the bacteria. And it's like um, it's that I think that has something to do with the value or the transvaluation mm -hmm. in in that kind of reciprocal relationship. I would like to add to, to that Robert's um, subtle wrap up that interestingly, what Andre. Uh, previously referred to as uh, John Protelli's draft that he read is and his granular concept of subjectivity. It will be published in Log 52, the summer issue, uh, under my guest uh, editorship, and it will and there will be an alliance with most of the concepts and problems that they are addressing here. There will be a piece by Sample Printer on Ecology. And there will be uh, another piece, a conversation between me and Elizabeth Gross, I'm talking about architecture, but also animal architecture and feminism and how these contested spaces can be rethought. And I think the, to, to respond to Star Wars directly, that I will be arguing for this demonic, I would say, thought this seemingly ridiculous thought in this in this uh, in in the very editorial intro uh, which i tentatively uh, right now titled cosmo aesthetics that aesthetics itself is not reduced neither to the human nor the animal world but it pervades the cosmos right? it pervades the cosmos and, and how to think of it to uh, from the human to the animal from the neanderthal architectures to the very formation of the earth the lava, the fire that we are talking about, we are all descendants of the Hadean rocks, the lava of this world, right? We did not come here out of you know, nowhere. The, 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 the abiogenetic evolution of life on Earth uh, was indeed uh, part of this uh, continuity, if you will, of fire and sense. And, uh, and insofar as we rethink the question of life, let's say, to recursive concepts, I would even say, self-organization, self-regulation, self-formation, self-sufficiency, uh, with uh, Dolmini's uh, beautiful, beautiful framing uh, in terms of uh, symbiosis. To we choose to redefine life and sense-making with you know, relational concepts as the channeling of underlying potentials of existence, that being and acting and informing, uh, into relational uh, notions like enacting and undergoing open-ended change, right? Affecting and being affected. In so far as we redefine life in, the, in those terms, in, in so far as we understand aesthetics and sense making in the sense of expressing that vitality that we channel to use uh, what Star Wars likes to use, the implication of life, the, 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 the the folding in of life and then complicating it and then unfolding it or giving it back to the environment. In so far as we understand that is the aesthetics, then even the black holes, even the you know, planets in, in terms of their nucleosynthesis uh, have their own aesthetic dimensions.
So then you would propose Gokan, and I think Sin and Agnieszka would agree with you. I'm curious about the uh, AZ kill there. That fire or burning could be understood broader as intensity and intensifying. Or not? I mean, I, I saw the chat and I, hearing also Gokan, I would take the burning to intensifying, understanding it as intensifying. So, so you, if you take that away from from this uh, from this uh, uh, the understanding of I don't know purity like a, a, a means to to uh, to achieve purity and all that I mean just take that rhetoric away and think of it as the pure force of it. So of course I, I think that um, I would yeah. Analyzing. Ezekiel wanted to say something. I think. Uh, yeah, no, I actually. Uh, I think. I think Heidi um, just. I think said it well. I, I wouldn't add anything else to that. Thank you. Sim, would you like to say something? Because I, I, I fundamentally agree with <laughs> burning slash intensity slash transforming relations. Um, I, I, I'm a little shy to talk because okay. I'm in the public. I'm probably, I feel like I'm not contributing as well as I should to the conversations. I'm reserve, reserving chat. Um, and the reason I mentioned Heraclitus is because among the four elements, at least the way I interpreted Heraclitus, um, it, fire has a unique um, characteristic in that uh, it's not so much a substance, it's a power. It's a power of trans transformation, at least for the way I interpreted Heraclitus, it, is that fire has a distinct um, role in that it, 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 it performs the it is the agent, trans, agent of transformation, not only of itself, but of all the other uh, substances as well. And I always found that to be really quite beautiful. And so, yes, I truly, I do think it's quite interesting to think in terms of relation. If, you, if, we, if we do think relationally, <clears throat> then maybe some of the discussions could be, um, we could have an alternative to thinking about um, uh, doing something to a thing, like burning it down. What is the it, et cetera, et cetera, who's doing the burning, et cetera, et cetera. And in the, in, if we do take that relational uh, approach, then we can think about um, what, uh, let's say this, what affords more life? What is life giving? What's life affirming or life giving or life articulating? So that's why I was so taken by earlier Lu Lucia or Lucia's comments and sorry, subsequent comments about engagement, uh, about practice, about what our students are doing, especially students who are going to be engaged in material, social material practices, okay? So I think that it's, it's easier for me to talk about, um, how do you say, wholesale replacement of systems when I have tenure, okay? It's not the case with most of the people on this planet. They don't have tenure, okay? So lifetime appointment, okay? So just do a little ultra reflection here. So given that, okay, then there's no, no fulcrum, no place that I can sit, that most people can sit to one side Right, and do a wholesale transformation of the rest of the world. Okay, we don't have that. Like most people, people don't have that luxury. Okay, I, so I think take that from practice back into theory. Okay, how will we think this way? So yes, that's why we talk about metas. That's why earlier we talked about. I talked about metas uh, dense meta stability or dense criticality. You know, extend extend criticality, including ourselves conceptually. Right. So this is why I think it's not such a strong distance between, big distance between theory and practice, right? But we're doing it here. It's really quite, I think it's really quite encouraging what I'm hearing here, right? Um, so this is my ramble, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, technology. Um, uh, that's why I think maybe we could perhaps bracket all these technologies that we are given, including the technology of um, finance and money. We don't have to uh, take money at, this is working by other people, take money as given by carbon capitalism or surveillance capitalism or informatic capitalism, what have you, all right? We can bracket that and then we investigate that. So I use that opportunity to uh, recommend um, another uh, friend uh, and fellow traveler, Nicholas Damiris, who's been working for many, many years on an alternative formulation of money. I'll put his references here in chat. Okay. Um. Just to note, Stavros, because I think we have one person from our audience, Felix. I think I know this is the um, who has been commenting on the thread. So if you would want to ask or make your comment directly. I think he's pushing us uh, 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 from the thermodynamics to the semiotic flux. Exactly. Mm. Well, if he wants to directly engage with the group, 
guess. Felix, we want to see you. <laughs> just that I have a very, it's just that my office is really, uh, is really messy. I haven't been able to, I've just moved, oh. in, moved into this space and it's like a real mess. And the, uh, the Mac won't, you won't, here, take a look. It's there, it's not, it's not like I'm a monster or anything. Some people already know me. Yes, yes, hi. <laughs> Bonjour. Oh. Hello. So yeah, it's my office. Is uh, my office still a mess? I've been here for uh, for a short while. Yeah, no, I mean it just uh, value is one of my one of my I guess pet pet things. I'm I'm a post uh, doctoral researcher here in Brazil in the UFS, UFSM, which is uh, the University of Federal University of Santa Maria. I'm also a, a member of uh, Shinwei's uh, uh, prototyping social forms. Uh, I guess conversations or seminars, or uh, to which uh, Dilmini is also a, uh, a participant. And so I just, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm into all these all these ideas that have been uh, that are being kicked around this afternoon. Uh, I'm an avid reader of, uh, of Simondon, and I guess for me, I'm uh, my uh, my postdoctoral project will be on um, eye tracking. Uh, in order to be able to determine what is the uh, the value um, the value producing proposition that uh, that happens uh, in eye movement, eye movement being driven uh, subconsciously, I guess to a certain extent uh, without anyone's knowledge of what is really going on. I want to see. I want to try to examine what the logic is that drives uh, that drives eye movement. And how that happens uh, as a value proposition, a value as a value-producing proposition. So that's why, you know, when uh, when Stavros mentioned the uh, the idea of value, I sort of thought of uh, you know I guess three different ways which uh, in which value can be seen as a non uh, you know non-moralistic construction. I think this is also a very interesting symptomatological study for, let's say, if we want to generalize that back again into um, regimes of attention, you know, like in, in Stiegler's sense, like what do we attend to, what do we care for, um, and how maybe these ways actually also imply like these, these specific foci, you know, like how is, how is even like that, say, the, the production of that kind of knowledge tied back into a system that does something with it, and I think these these things are very interesting uh, to go back in. Um, I think Matthew said that before with a distinction between, let's say, it's just, let's say, neutral information or how that is directly tooled within citational practices. Now, how do these things become enfolded into a discourse and by whom and in, in, in what aim? I think I think that that would help elaborate, let's say, this 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 distinction a little bit. Greg, I have a feeling using my Zoom intuition techniques that you might want to say something or not. Well, I was thinking about affect and value in terms of uh, something you said, Andre, about the, the Protevi piece, which I repeat pieces that he was sharing online. And this and this notion that he refers to as, you know, the, 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 the either the this notion of granularity is either too baggy or as being too idiosyncratic. And of course, there's that distinction in Bergson about you know, the, the notion of difference of degree and difference of kind, and this kind of notion of, instead of imagining what Ezekiel was calling these positionalities, these demarcated kind of, you know, identity structures, but imagining things that as, as kind of thresholds, even if you go back to the notion of, you know, painting the same mountain over and over again, this idea of these kind of intensities and these kind of thresholds that arise, and how that ties into something like um, the Leibniz and differential calculus and the way in which Blues wants to see this the way in which a curve in differential calculus reaches a point of singularity or this hexaity in which suddenly there's a there's a moment in which we can think about the who, the what, the why, the when, the time of day, the animal, et cetera, all arrive at this, at this moment of hexaity, which to me gets, and I'm going to tie everything together accidentally, goes back to the question of what Matthew was saying at the beginning about how do we think about affect and uh, and 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 the notion of citationality, which to me is again that kind of that moment of like a hook by which we have a suddenly this notion of a style or the arrival of a certain kind of different kind of a difference of degree and, uh, and not of kind that suddenly produces a, a recognizability or a, a new way of living, um, which might require some, some amount of burning, 
Um, but, and also thinking a bit about, again, I'm ranging all over the place. So also thinking about governmentality and how, you know, when Deleuze wants to advance, uh, or not advance, but just build on Foucault's ideas of, you know, the sovereign society, the splinter society, and then finally, the notion of control society, and how this draws on a notion of env environmentality, right, and a notion of something that is, uh, which to me goes back to the notion of the kind of plane of eminence, right, this kind of, this, this kind of a boundless sense of capacity that increasingly capital is drawing upon, I think, you know, the idea of that kind of closed system or recursivity that Ezekiel points to is part of a kind of former disciplinary mechanism of society. But increasingly, capital wants to move ahead or in front of us, right? It wants to open up a space before we even ask the question on Google. They want to give us the response or they want to formulate the question for us. And so there's this idea increasingly of how in kind of the racial capital of today, that space uh, that is that kind of that space that Ezekiel says opens up to the catastrophe, you know, or to chaos or the aleatory, is a space that's been always occupied by a certain by it's always pre pre it was pre uh, created by the kind of division uh, racial division that's a kind of space of blackness, um, and to me that kind of space of Afro pessimism and some of the other kind of ways in which we think about the role of you know the the uh, the kind of comforts and the complicities that, that uh, Agnieszka was talking about, about how we fall into these patterns, uh, and, and Matthew's attuned to this as well, uh, are really important to, to take knowledge of today in our conversations about how we imagine design space. And I'm sorry that didn't add up to anything, but it was a bunch of things. I have a thousand notes that you were all so great at generating things. I'll translate them later into something that made sense. It's great to hear because that was the purpose. It was to keep the, get everyone going on the same, let's say, burning levels. That was the intention of today. I, I think it's also wonderful. Go, go on. Please go on. Okay. Okay. Just quickly. Um, I forgot to add something else about um, enabling life. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a stream of work that might be really powerful here, which is uh, looking at plant life. And, and vegetal thought, like Michael Martyr's work, for example. Um, and, and we observe that uh, plants are unique among living beings in that, in that they, they don't occupy the excluded middle between eat or be eaten, right? Because they enable uh, other creatures to partake of them and they, can, and they continue to live, they continue to live. In fact, it's part of their um, life cycle, part of their ecology and part of their metabolism. To be to to enable other beings to partake of them and to enable other life to to live, so that's quite interesting. Different from the animal condition, uh, another is is um, and they intensify, right? They grow by intensity. Let's say they have growth. Thinking of Goethe and Darwin's work and more recent work, a lot of more recent work. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Also, they are the forms of life that convert light into life through photosynthesis, right? They're unique. In fact, in a sense, it's, it's a characteristic of plants, so they do this. So it's something maybe we can think about that because it brings us between from the, um, these kind of more formal ways of thinking about uh, transformation and transduction into a metabolism. And I'm, I'm saying this because I'm trained my, on myself in physics and mathematics. So I, I know I think that way more naturally, but I'm trying to learn more about a way of thinking metabolically, okay, from colleagues either in the sciences or from philosophy. To give one little example, this is from due to Giuseppe Longo in Paris. Mm -hmm. He noted that uh, 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 neuro, uh, sorry, that um, biological chemists uh, discovered that the way the water molecules work in terms of this quantum state of spin is different when they are near a cell wall than when they're in free water. So then it was the quantum properties of water molecules are different because of biological conditions, whether they are water molecules near the cell wall. And so they, they perform this function of allowing more ready, um, I'll explain why, versus when they're just water molecules in, the, in free water. Okay, why? It turns out, why is not the right question, but, but it, so what? The what is, so what is because this performs a key role in making those membranes permeable to certain kinds of dissolved agents, 
to ions that function in the metabolism of the cell. So this is an example of how quantum mechanical properties are actually macro in the biological systems, which is not true in physics. Okay, just one example. Right. So Fantastic. We, we, have a proponent of we have a proponent of vegetarian in, in the room. Agnieszka, would you care to mention this? Uh, uh, well, I'm I, uh, no like uh, I, I, uh, I strongly uh, advise uh, Shinve. Maybe you know already Shpela Petrich work. Uh, so she's um, she's an artist that works on vegetarian that she actually uh, somehow took from Sandylands. Uh, so um, so, but then you know to think about the plants as complicit to capitalism. Right, so through this in betweenness, right? So through this also easiness for them to be complicit in biopiracy, in agriculture, and you know, in in capitalist regimes, uh, uh, to see ourselves in the con in the in the context of algorithm as plants would mean, you know, to find ways of resistance, right? Through looking at plants. So to acknowledge our complicity that we are indeed in the eyes of algorithm. This is what Shpela Petrich in her work is uh, saying. And in the eyes of, eyes of algorithm, we are the plants. But instead of being, you know, um, um, uh, um, you know, pessimistic, right? Uh, what are the modes of affirmation? How can we create forms of resistance um, that that would enable the flourish, uh, to, to enable bodies to flourish? Um, I don't have any answer. It's just like I'm because I don't know. so this is something really interesting. I really appreciate uh, Shinwei that you brought the plants right um, into the table because uh, this is something uh, that um, you know also is intriguing in the context of our discussion. But I would say it's no coincidence that uh, yeah we can refer to plants because I mean understanding the way that Shin put it. It, one could say that plants are more, I mean, I'm simplifying now, more open to transindividuality. So they're more open, let's say, to become part of what we can call in transindividual becoming. And by default, therefore, they're also much more effectively open. They have much more capacities to affect and be affected than something else. And therefore, they're, in that sense, much more, how can I put that? It's much easier to be captured and taken advantage of and transform something that they're part of than something else. And in that sense, it would be interesting, and I would say could be perhaps one of the focuses uh, or where this book might focus uh, as a project that continues. How could we think of other elements like that? How can we think of how can we multiply, as Hugh was saying before? How can we find styles of multiplying our plants around us? And by plants, I mean it metaphorically now. How could we find all these other instances that are open to transindividuation, are effectively open in order to determine or affect where this so-called design space defaces itself? Where, what could be the next stage of this design space? So in other words, track down singularities, you know? On that note, I would suggest that we uh, wrap it up now that the energy is still high. Uh, so any final thoughts uh, from anybody in the room? I, I saw that uh, uh, Bob has already answered uh, some of the questions in the chat. He, he's multitasking heavily. I don't know how he can do that. Hey, I'll just jump in on because the plants have been introduced. Uh, mm -hmm. We now know the new forest ecology uh, uh, is really amazing with regard to the concept of the holobiont, which I think Dolmini was um, uh, pointing toward. That, that is to say that there's no, every living being is, a, uh, is, is an ecology of more than one living. And, and so what we know is that, that basically uh, uh, plants and animals emerged in the fullness of evolutionary time with a complement of microbial and or fungal um, uh, collaborators, um, and that forests are, uh, 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 that, that the plants and the fungi have gotten together for hundreds of millions of years. In fact, the fungi were already uh, evolved, uh, allowing plants 
to then make a stand on dry land, right? They, so they moved onto the land out of the oceans together as a, a, as, a consorted, as a consorted survival strategy that could then make something of this hideous volcanic, uh, you know, uh, a continental environment that otherwise was just like a, a syncytium of bacteria, uh, but nothing that, that, you know, was more than like uh, just a, a scum on the ground. Anyways, the point being that, uh, uh, well, <laughs> we're all in this thing together. Um, and, 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 and so I would just like to say the, the auto and autopoiesis, I'm, I'm okay with sympoiesis, but that's really Haraway. That's not Margulis precisely. That's Haraway kind of taking Margulis and doing Haraway. Heteropoiesis is fine, but but the auto just simply doesn't have to do with the the immunizing of the of the self from other selves, but rather just the the condition of possibility that a self takes care of itself, uh, takes care of its own living business, and then is offered to the ecology to be part of some larger consortium. So. There you go. I think this is perfect for, for, for the final statement. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you for your contribution. And we hope uh, uh, that we can continue this uh, and uh, we will follow it up no, very no, soon. No, I, we, we don't hope, we don't hope. We, we are sure that this is gonna be continued and you're gonna soon within the week from us about how it's gonna be continued. Thank you very, very much. And uh, uh, take care and uh, be safe and hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.